Recording is on. Well, it's Sunday, December the 12th, and welcome to the Eastern Extinctionati meeting, everybody. Nice to see such a big crowd. I didn't think so many people would be on. Um, I thought it was getting more Christmassy, and I thought everybody was doing the, the Christmas stuff. But uh, nice to see everybody. Um, anything on the agenda that anybody wanted to, to put up? Uh, I made a rough agenda um, with a question that Gary had um, about... Uh, discernment or discrimination. Uh, does anybody have any topics they want to discuss first? Any news from the week or anything? From the okay, Lynn, well, the, should uh, we start? The, the failure. Gary, wait, do you want to formulate a question? Yeah, look. What do you want to start with discrimination or do you want to get my little bits of junk out of the way first because they might not amount to much? Um, I had uh, one question was, do you think that it's about time that we rename this group given its new mission, uh, which is about to unfold, you know, when you reveal the uh, manifesto? And I just put there, you know, should we rename ourselves the the Flipped Earth Society, <clears throat> which, um, you know, no, makes our I, makes our I, mission I, obvious. No, I I thought the Extinction Idea was great. Um, yeah, Extinction Idea is not like, taken by any other group. Let's, uh, we, let's, we, uh, yeah. But anyway, I, I didn't think we were changing direction. I always wanted to tell people about the flipping. I just, it's just impossible to tell people about it because they just, it's just too incredible and they've never heard about it. So they, uh. <laughs> and so I thought, well, you have to introduce it a little bit and, um, you know, just start with uh, something like, you know, with a cult or something. It's easy to fold it into the beliefs of a cult. But, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's 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 one of those strange things where people just uh, are busy playing in front of the steamroller and they've completely got their eye on the wrong ball. So whenever anybody talks about the Greenland ice sheet melt and stuff, they, they talk about, you know, sea level rise in 2100 and stuff. And it's like, I, I want to vomit every time I hear that. It's like they're way more, you know, that's the least of our world worries there's way more serious stuff before then but yeah the, i think it's it's the it's the first chink in uh if you can get through to anybody to take it seriously it's making the whole world view unravel because we're all in this kind of belief that uh, the world is really robust and things never change and everything's rather secure and they forget that we you know just absolutely raises edge all the time on this ball spinning around the sun and the sun, you know, has these flares and there's this gamma, you know, activity from these gamma ray bursts. And when they hit us, we'd be fried and they comet streaming around and the earth is, the climate system is chaotic and everybody treats it like it's smooth and you can dial it up and down like it's, you know, the, the thermostat on your, in your office. It's like uh, everybody's just completely an upside down world. And so it's the very first, you know, both psychologically and literally, where people start to turn their world upside down. And in any way, you know, that's that's what it's all about. The kind of rebirth is psychological or physical. Uh, just just change our socioeconomic way of life. It's just it's walking through a mirror. It is just inverting. It's you know flipping left or right or 
inverting the world. That, I mean, I say all these things, I don't think anybody really takes me literally or seriously. But you will one day, you'll suddenly go, my fuck, who was actually saying that? Why didn't we listen? <laughs> you, because you, you think it's all like kind of fantasy or uh, a game or something like that. And they say like, no, it's presented as a game because the, it's too much for people to take. And, and um, in one thing. So it's a, the whole project, the ARG and everything, is just a way of sugarcoating what's, uh, what's really going to happen. Um, and, but, you know, it's, it's, it puts you uh, somewhere around flat earthers <laughs> to tell people. So it's, it's like the worst of the conspiracy theory and it's the worst of deep doom. And, you know, it's like, so how do you tell people? Yeah. It's like, well, I think we're running out of time. So you just got to come and say, you just got to beat people over the head with it. Say, don't worry about fucking sticking your, you know, gluing your tits to the road. It's, it's too late. It's too late, guys. You know, get ready. <laughs> the shit is about to hit the fan. I was thinking about, um, yeah, uh, it, because you put, you put, the, the you, put flip. I mean, uh, you put up the movie or somebody did about David Icke. And, uh, I think there were some other things. Uh, discussed during the week and uh, you know when you look at it um, I, I don't think he lost any followers by making an outrageous claim in order to, to smuggle in some some fairly interesting thoughts uh, you know um, no, uh, he, a lot of a, a lot of people claim I mean, he, he, did. He, he went down to single digits right he went he went down to single digit and then then he he got them all back. Eventually, he was filling uh, Wembley Stadium with crowds and tens of thousands. And that, you know, but he got them all back when everybody started to realize maybe this guy's not so nutty. But then, yeah, what you're really funny. telling everybody is that they're nuts. You're telling people they're nuts. And it's way easier for them to say, what is the chance that, you know, 7.6 billion people are nuts? Surely you're the nut. <laughs> you say, like, you know, sanity is not something you can put to the vote. Just because 7.8 billion people are in this massive delusion doesn't mean that they're sane. But that's, you know, the, the world demands that that's the way you, you interpret it because it's pejorative to say people are insane. But they're demonstrably insane. I mean, we, we're heading for collapse of civilization and they're burning fossil fuel like there's no tomorrow. I mean, come on, we, by, by what measure are people not insane? The world is barking fucking mad. But, you know, as an individual, you can't tell people that. It's like, who are you to tell the world they're mad? Well, sorry, one of us is mad, and I'm not destroying myself. They are. It's interesting that even so, um, yeah, even Eckhart Tolle said that, um, you know, in his own little way, made the same comment. Um, uh so uh, there's so many strands to this. Is once you once you start down this path, then you know it's just reflected back to you again and again and again. It's like Tolle's New Earth and every, this general idea that there's a rebirth coming. You know, every, even Ray Kurzweil's Singularity in 2045. It, there's this idea of this pregnancy, of, you know, this expectation of this kind of grand rebirth, even the Christians have the rapture. <laughs> and, but, uh, you know, nobody examines it. And nobody looks at it with a, a fine tooth comb. Any, they're just a whole lot of evangelists. It's like the, <clears throat> the futurists and stuff. They have this mad hand-waving bullshit about Mars and AI. And nobody stops and questions you know, in detail. Okay, let's go through your little story. No one does it. I mean, we do it a bit here, but like, who challenges Pinker and in any serious depth? You know, I mean, who challenges uh, Elon Musk and says, very few people say, like, you do know you're fucking barking mad. No one is going to fucking Mars. No one's going to live on Mars. Are you fucking nuts? It's like talking about, we, we're going to move to live inside the inside of a you know nuclear reactor. It's like, Oh, you're nuts. Well, Elon Musk just said that, and he's a genius, <laughs> according to the world. So it's like, we are fucking nuts. All of us are it, fucking, it's the, uh, it's fucking mad. It's the but same. Nobody, we allow each other our madness. It's the same um, era of uh, 
that's been made all the way along with, with religions and, and all of this stuff is that I think they're looking for, uh, they're expecting this to be an external thing. It, nobody nobody stops to think that this, this rebirth is something for them. It, it's always something that's, go, it's an outside agency. It, it, it's not, not their shift. We, you get to remain the same and enjoy the fireworks show and everything else changes and then it's all, all I don't know, whether it's all right again or whatever, whatever the new order becomes. Uh, but nobody stopped to think, oh, hey, hang on, this, uh, this transformation is not out there, it's in here. Um, so we're always well, looking. Both. Oh, well, it it's is. But, both. You see, yeah, I know now it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's what all the activists, this is the problem the activists are making, is, I mean, you can't come to, it takes decades to, to figure all this stuff out. I mean, well, it took me decades. Maybe you were smarter and you can do it quicker. But the, the, the I mean, the, the activists are all doing that. They're all doing like, we're the good guys. We're going to take over from the bad guys and then change the world and like complete change to the world. It's like, really? And you're not going to change at all. <laughs> the workers are still going to be workers. And the middle class are still going to be consumers. And it's like, you know, we're all still going to have democracy, even though none of that has worked. It's like, you know, it's like, it, you really, no one's going to change, but the world is going to change. All the, you know, all the uh, futurologists. Oh, we're going to be flying cars and have AI and the world is going to be changed. But we're going to be the same old shitheads. <laughs> it's like, How? How could it possibly be if we actually got Ray, Ray Kurzweil's Rapture of the Nerds? It's like, you mean the nerds aren't going to change? They're just going to waltz in like, oh, gates open. And it's like, you know, Black Friday sale and all the shitheads walk in with all the shit that's in their head. It's like, seriously, how do you get to this utopia with all these fuckheads to, from a slave plantation? It's like, obviously, if you fill utopia full of slaves, You've just relocated the slave plantation. You know? Hugh, can no. I jump in there? Because I've Not just, um, just that that's a good point. Uh, because I've just actually finished listening to last week's meeting just now. And, um, uh, you know, where you're talking about, uh, well, you mentioned a couple of times how, you know, even if the, uh, the psychopaths hanging out in their spaceships were the only ones to survive, you know, and if they came back down to Earth and, and all the rest of it. Um, and uh, well, anyway, regardless of who survives, if, if you posit a situation where some small number of human beings survive, um, now you know they're not going to be able to re establish industrial technological civilization, um, they may be able to do what they can do with the residual junk that's left, probably. Um, um and you've also mentioned as well, you've also mentioned before about like the tragedy of the loss of, of, of conscious awareness, which could take, you know, forever to re, to re evolve or maybe it wouldn't ever do it. Um, but you, you, you've, um, the, I suppose the question is, you know, you've got some, some imaginary small group of human beings survive, who've survived. Um, is there, are they going to, do you have confidence that they're going to not just um, go down the same pathway again in terms of the massive psychological error that's being made at, at the moment? You know, that the alien cortex is just not going to reassert. Well, absolutely. It, if the climate regime doesn't allow agriculture. No, no, yeah, let me... Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, go, go on, go on. Yeah, I was going down the same path as you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go, go um, if the climate regime doesn't allow agriculture for some generations, people might, you know, be subtle in the hunting and gathering. Again, they won't do it. They might forget, you know, the civilized consciousness. Uh, possibly. More, more serious than that. They can, you, you can't know more serious than that. You can't uh, recreate industrial civilization because... It's a one-off that was done on fossil fuels. We've used all of half of the, the fossil fuels. And if you, you know, pull the rug out of industrial society, they can't get to the other half. In other words, 
we're at the point where to mine the oil that we're doing now, you need all the technology that we have. So it's kind of like they won't be able to get back because, you know, for want of a, a nail, the, you know, the horse was unshod and for want of the horse, the, you know, the message was not sent and for want of the message, the battle was lost. And so you can't, can't get there from here. This is a problem that I don't think people really understand about technology in general, especially historians of technology, which is funny. But it works like this. Uh, imagine it's, how can I explain this simply? So you often hear his, historians of tech um, say stuff which is completely batshit crazy, like um, kind of history stone, popular, popular re, you know, reviews of history, and uh, particularly on the History Channel, I think they're very guilty of this one, where they do these counterfactuals, and they talk about like Heron, Her Heron of Alexander, right? Heron of Alexander made a steam engine, <laughs> it made a steam turbine in like, I don't know, 30 BC or something, maybe even more, 300 BC. Anyway, so somewhere very before COVID. And they, they uh, so then they say, you know, what a dipshit he was. Uh, you know, he could have just put that on a wagon and, you know, the, the Industrial Revolution would have started 2000 years ago. It's like, no, you morons, of course not. The way to see it is, is to... Um, is to think of Heron going to some investors, which is quite feasible. This is what he would literally have to do if he wanted to start the Industrial Revolution. He would go to some investors and say, look, I have this steam turbine, and you just put some coal underneath and you know, heat up some water, steam comes out of these nozzles. Woo, look at this thing go. Say so like, you look at the speed of this thing. You know, we could fly airplanes, we could have like, you know, we could have carriages driven without horses and stuff like that. And the investors would be laughing. They would laugh. Do you know why? It's, it's just not economically feasible. They would ask the first it's question they'd ask, Heron, asshole, is like, what, what, what's made out of? You'd say metal. It's so like the guy who mines metal would say like, oh, you're fucking kidding me. Metal? You made this out of metal. Why don't you just make it out of gold, idiot? So you say, no, no, well, well, metal is just right for doing this. And you say, where are you going to get the metal from? Well, from a mine like you. So you say, how much metal do you need? Well, we need about a kilogram. A kilogram of metal? That's five years' work for my entire operation, you moron. So like, I, I would need 10,000 slaves working for 10 years to get your fucking kilogram of metal. And it would be like, and then you say, okay, so here, my metal is in, in like uh, Spain. So that's where we mine our metal. So how are you getting get this kilogram of metal from Spain to like Greece or, or Alexandria? I would be like, uh, we'll use ships. Okay, but now it's like this voyage, you've already cost about as much as like five slaves. So why don't I just you get the five slaves, pull it around, and then I've saved that money. Is that like, okay, but anyway, is that all it needs, metal? No, no, it needs coal. Coal? Coal? You mean you fucking get coal? You need a continuous supply of coal? Why don't you just put an ox there and feed it straw? It would be way cheaper. You know, it's so like you carry on, you know, try and make this business. And I can't believe that historians of tech are this fucking stupid. It just means they've never done a pitch <laughs> to investors um, or something. But the investors would always tell you that, like, look, you know, you've got 10,000 slaves. They're always going to do better. The capital costs will always defeat it. I actually did this almost exactly once um, with, uh, okay, so I'll tell you a bit of my history. I did this, this glass thing, which you know about, but there was also the component was to, you know, save on uh, paint and stuff like that, but doing mosaics. So the idea was you get mosaics, uh, pixelate them according to a graphic, and you can, like, huge area could cover with very detailed graphics, make the glass uh, mosaics each a pixel right so uh, then it was you know basically laid with um robotic machine so that was the the thing so so then now there are people that do actually lay mosaics and you can you can get a picture a photograph and you know an image just um send it to them they will have them laid and so the guy that does this the biggest guy in the in the states when he heard that i was gonna do do this then he rang me up and he tried to convince me not to do it because he, I was going to automate him out of a business. And his argument was simple. He said, how much 
is it going one of these machines going to cost us at about 100k he said well i'm going to i'm going to bury you because for 100k i can get uh laborers in china at this stage they were much cheaper he said 30 cents an hour and basically i could how, you know how much mosaics can you lay so then basically it would have taken me about five years to catch up with him laying them with slave labor in china and so i you know i said basically i can make the business case but you've got to sink 100k into this machine uh, as a capital cost and recoup it over about five years if you're paying uh, slaves in china you can start on day one and you're churning out product you don't even have to develop and build the machine so so a lot of people have said slavery held holds uh, the, the world back but it's it's a dumb argument because it's um you know and stop the industrial but it's a dumb argument because we still got slavery today we everybody's still away slave they've just moved up a little they've exported all the industrial footprint to china and then you know all the rest are white collar workers so they're all doing bullshit jobs and generally paper shuffling but you know they're kind of supported on the back of the you know three child laborers in the third world uh but the and the rest is all just a paper chase and so yeah, but, you know but the, the basic was... thing is to get back to that I, I was just going to say to go back to what oh, yeah, Gary no, was oh, saying what happens to the alien cortex in the groups of survivors? Because even if they don't have the resources, if, if they can't do agriculture, even if they can't mine, even if they can't do technology, um, you know, there's still this this left intellectual kind of thing that we've been talking about for so long. And it, why would that disappear with the flipping? See, what, what are, uh, and it's just add to what Sophie said. Um, yeah, I think that the part, there's, there might be, I mean, I think what Ryan said about the, the you know, the uh, large scale agriculture won't, won't re-establish and that, the things that kind of um, pushed along the development of the alien cortex project. Um, but I was sort of concerned about the sort of interim period where these people have got a planet full of not resources that they can mine, but they've got a planet of leftover stuff. And, you know, all sorts of bits and pieces could still be got working again to some extent. Um, I mean, gradually over time, of course, they would lose functionality down to, to, to zero. But, you know, there, there will be a period of time, I think. Um, and given that people don't know anything else except the technological society, they would tend to want to try and return to something familiar um so there's that no point. no almost without question that's not going to happen I, i'm uh, not i'm just well, saying yeah, it, yeah it's yeah. almost so so the reason is that it's uh, no, nobody has any use for that you see that's very hard for us to understand because we you see the reason why the business plan works for for heron if heron could easily make the business plan for his um, steam Engine. turbine today. Yeah. The reason is because of all the network um, underneath. Basically, the, the economic system is is a dense, um, self-supporting mesh network. <laughs> kind of like they say that in the opening of threads that everything is actually self-supporting. So it's this vast network of think of it like an ecosystem. So that you know you can, if say engine breaks down, you can always send out for parts or something like that. You know so those parts can be manufactured because they can send out for lathes and for machines and for machining tools that make the part and on and on and on in this massive fragile super fragile mesh network now this is what people don't understand often is you meet people on reddit that say stuff like well you know we should be prepping and leave lots of like solar panels and stuff because people will need them afterwards say so, for what yeah. No, fuck it. they won't need fucking solar panels. Oh, the same so with all the other this... thing. What's wrong with the Mad Max future is you see guys flying in in cars and in in helicopters mm. and stuff made out of um, rusty materials. Say why? I'm telling you, when you have to look for food, you do not fucking wait building fucking helicopters and cars. Mm. <laughs> it's just like you don't have time for that shit because you're you're be a oh, hunter gatherer. Okay. Hunter gatherers don't have time for that shit. Okay. What it, what does a hunter gatherer use a solar panel for? It's the most useless thing known to man. You can't eat them. Hang on, I, I, uh, 
I think hunter gatherers have a lot more time than than industrials do, uh, but not in the no, collapse. No, they there only, isn't food only in an intact environment. You're only yeah, only in an intact environment where they know what they're doing. When when you start, a, if you have a look at survivalists like Bear Grylls, right? He all of his day is a struggle. Those the guys only get to the luxury original luxury society because they have a long tradition. They're leaning on the ancestors. The old people that tell them where the water hole is and stuff like that. But if you have no old people to tell you where the, where to dig in the dry riverbed to reach water, you've got to fucking dig all day trying to find water. So it's, it, they, they are leaning on the ancestors. They're leaning on a long chain and a large body of knowledge, which we have nothing of. Now, everybody thinks that, you know, it was people in our civilization, we think we're going to lean on the large body of information we have. We're going to lean on the internet and what Einstein told us and what Newton told us and what Tesla invented and all of this kind of thing. It's like, no, we're not. All of that stuff is unsupportable because it, it needs this advanced ecosystem um, of mutual support. Yeah, the other thing is here, uh, you know, related to well, what you're saying there, is that it's, um, you know, the system we've got now is something that actually depends now on the unbroken lineage of its ancestry, of its development. Um, because if you want to make something, you have to have a machine to make it. You have to have a machine to make the other machine and 10 oh, no, machines would, to make it. I would argue the opposite. So, yeah, I know you meant that I'm it, looking at it, it from... It depends on the broken lineage. Yeah. No, but I mean, we've got a, a lineage of machines that have developed over the Industrial Revolution. Um, and once they stop functioning, you you can't just... Uh, it's like what you're saying about the solar panels, that, that, you know, supposing there's some people left on the planet and they can still read and they go to a library and they find all these books, how to make a solar panel. But they'll soon realize that the problem is not how to make a solar panel, it's how to make about a thousand different machines that make a thousand other machines that make even more machines, which finally enable you to make a solar panel, even if you can get the resources together and, and the energy as well. So, so we're on this thing where where we, we uh, once you break that chain, once, see a lot of, it, it goes back to your gas, uh, your glass, glass uh, furnace. That once you a lot of these machines and a lot of these industries once you stop them this is not a light switch you just turn it back on again when you're ready um once you stop a lot of these things you can't you just can't go back yeah. to them and switch them on and expect to do anything anymore and given and they have only got to stop once and that will stop you from re-establishing that 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 um that that series of machines that lead to the thing you're trying to produce um yeah, so, you've so got, it's happening right now. It's, it's sort of, it's in a way, right related now. to what you're saying about the hunter-gatherers, that, you know, to, to be a hunter-gatherer starting from scratch in an impoverished environment where you've got none of your ancestral wisdom built up over vast times to, to fall back on is a very hard thing to do, although they can probably pull it off. Uh, so but I think the, it's happening. the comparable thing with technology probably couldn't be done. You, you're going to lose it. Well, it's... it's it's happening right now with the supply shock. So the, what you're seeing now is they stopped during lockdown. They just stopped the global supply chain. And I, I told, I mean, I said right back in the beginning of this pandemic that that you can't do that without having a lot of trouble when you start it up again. And that's exactly what's happened. And I explained why it's supply shock. So the uh, economists are taught the, the danger of supply shocks in a supply chain. So this is not only a supply chain, there's a supply web. But you see, relationships are still there. You, you can, you, the network will be damaged, but it's still quite resilient. In other words, if I need for a motor, when uh, things start up again, I can still phone up somebody in my regular supplier from me ago and say oh it's a tough pandemic but uh, anyway can i put in an order and he says to me well yeah but you know i've got hundreds i've got a massive backlog i will get to you sometime around the end of 22 
And in the meantime, there are large problems with capital distribution and stuff. So you might phone up the guy and you can't get hold of him because he, he went bust during the, <coughs> the interim time because of capital constraints. You, you don't see that the logistics of shuffling all of the this, uh, material around the world also is backed by a even huger shuffle of um, base, uh, fiscal. It's basically, there's this huge financial system that is shuffling, you know, trillions and trillions shuffle a day in financial instruments that are really representative of a very small number of goods that get shipped relatively, you know, not the, there's something like a trillion a day circulating around just in Forex just to pay for all of the crap on the containers. But the containers themselves probably have a hundredth of that or a tenth of that. So, so uh, yeah, you can shock the, the whole system. It's just imagine it like an ecosystem. You can take a lot of species out. Where these, um, these networks have the characteristics of a small world network, so they, they are kind of scale-free. Um, and so what those uh, those networks break down, particularly they change phase at about 50%. So you can take out 50% of the nodes and then you're gone. The whole thing is gone at 50%. So we probably took out about 10%, but we'll recover from, from this, from the, the pandemic. Uh, eventually everybody will sort it out and there'll be a big shuffle and everybody will get back. What you can't do after this is Without oil, if you if you take uh, oil or stuff out of the mix, the guys won't be able to get. Uh, they won't be able to mine deep enough. They won't have the tech to to you know. Uh, you can see the the EROAI on uh, in oil is is a, is a representation of how difficult it is to get to, and you know unless you're just like scooping it out of a, a lake, um, hunter gatherers are not going to get to any cheap sources of energy. So they're going to have to spend their whole day. They're not going to be like hunter-gatherers and stuff because the hunter-gatherers' sources of energy are, are fat on game and things like that. Um, and the game is, uh, you know, using grassland and savanna. And so those are the energy sources. They're not kind of there anymore. So, so the guys are going to have to work their ass off to get energy all the fucking time. And it certainly won't be fossil fuel energy and like there's not much forestation left. So you've got to have a fire at night and stuff just to survive and you've got to have skins and stuff. So, you know, you're going to be working your fucking ass off getting those things if the, uh, you know, the global supply chain breaks down, which it certainly will. It's so damn but fragile. This is my so, issue. Yeah, the, but. Uh, this is. Ahead. This is my issue with uh, John Michael Greer's retro future and stuff, is that he's saying we, we could go back to a sustainable level of technology at, um, you know, uh, a century ago or a few decades ago where, um, you know, 1930s technology or something. And uh, but that's not feasible because that uh, you can't get parts for those things. You can't buy those things that the supply chain is extinct. For the for that level of technology, we can't go well, back. It, yeah, the, the economically. Yeah, it's it's like a fire saying like, well, the fire can die back to you know the little burning embers we had before, and say no, it can't. Then we lost the fuel. It's not like well, oh, when the fire dies out, we'll we'll die die back to the fire we created a hundred years ago. It's like no, the fire's consumed everything. See, yeah. isn't the other thing, too, that the, the existence of even the 1930s technology depended upon a system that was absolutely devoted to expanding and growing? Otherwise, it couldn't right. have, um, you know, so you've got that additional thing as well, that even if you went back, it would still come for, it would still expand again. Yeah, but what I wanted to ask you uh, also and add to the discussion, what I said earlier, like if you think about Robinson Crusoe, for example, the book we all read when we were kids and your man is on his island and he's got, you know, what does he do all day is try to recreate a, a sort of simile British life with a structure, with a Sunday uh, uh, off and every day working his ass to make furniture and to, to try to get back to exactly what he had when he was living in, the, in, in England. And, and I mean, that's what I'm talking about. The, 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 that part of the brain is going to emerge uh, maybe completely intact 
and you're going to have the same kind of behavior. I know. Look, he's working all day. Robinson uh, is so, all day. Okay. okay, yeah, so this is where I wanted to get to. I was trying to get off the tech track and get onto this because this is the, the, the question I was trying to get onto is how, why does the alien cortex survive? It can't. It can't survive in any, in any form. So what's Robinson Crusoe is Friday. See, the, the reason why Robinson Crusoe can get back to some semblance of, you know, like I remember the, the book when I was a kid and they have this, this um, uh, little panel, this little etching on the thing, and they have Robinson Crusoe like a Roman emperor eating grapes. And then, they, you know, the, the caption is, how like a king we dined. But like it's only him. Friday's serving him up shit. You know, his man Friday is a slave. So, so that's what's wrong with it, because what uh, it's very subtle. But you see that the emperors need slaves, right? And you say, well, why did they only get slaves? And after the younger Dryas, when civilization started, so you can only recreate the shift with slaves. That's fundamental to the thing. So it's, why didn't we only get slaves there? It's because they had options. You see, they, before, it's what happened after the Younger Dryas, and particularly in the uh, Fertile Crescent and stuff, is the guys didn't have any options. What made Egypt was slaves. And what made the slaves of Egypt is the desert. They couldn't escape. You can show this in, um, there are lots of models for, you know, how you can have a fair hierarchy um, kind of thing. They model it on a computer and then say the only way you can keep a hierarchy fair, and the, there's a very interesting paper I read about a decade ago about this, is they said they could only find one way and they make, uh, and that's to make the nodes um, able to defect from the system. So in other words, if the slave can walk with their feet, then the hierarchy can be fair. But here's the thing. If they can walk with their feet, you'll never have a hierarchy. What stopped hierarchies coming about was everybody could fuck off. As soon as somebody was an arsehole, you just fucked off. What makes the business corporation today work in America and all over the world is that people have to suffer the arsehole. You put an arsehole in, in you know, managing all these people, and they can't fuck off. They have to go in and spend eight hours a day listening to this cunt, which they would put, you know, put an axe in his head and walk away in a hunter-gatherer society. So it allows people to be a bunch of shits. It allows psychopathy, in fact. So the alien court really gets into gear with civilization. Now, when civilization goes, the alien cortex has to go. First of all, there's a big filter. This is like, you know, kind of like the the Fermi filter or whatever it's called, you know, the uh, another thing about what, why the Fermi paradox, why there aren't, um, why there aren't more civilizations. And one of the theories is there's a great filter and, uh, you know, people, yeah, we kind of screw it up like we are now. Um, but it, it literally is like that. So think of, go through what the alien cortex has to go through to make it through the flipping in in this whole scenario. Straight away, you can see the, a large part of the psychopaths are eliminated. So, so take, for example, why uh, people are saying, like, I've seen a few people say something to the lines of, we shouldn't let all the psychopaths and rich people and billionaires survive the flippening. And I say, like, you can. It's, uh, it's going to be difficult enough for anybody to survive. Their kids will be completely different to, to their parents. So even if Jeff Bezos made it through the flipping in outer space and came back again, he's not going to survive long. He's probably going to be killed off by his own kids. So just look at the preppers now. Look, they can't survive. Just look at the prepper mentality. Is They're individualists acting like individuals, and they have this attitude of like, I'm going to survive. Fuck you and everybody else. And you say, if you have that attitude, which is the quintessential alien cortex, it's self, self-supporting. It's you know mutually uh, self-supporting, and uh, it's xenophobic. It's uh, it's everything that you uh, that will kill you off as a hunter gatherer. So all the traits that civilization made the psychopathy and this hierarchy and this idea of uh, of the king, the the big chief, the you know. 
it kicks off straight away in Samaria. It kicks off with in Uruk. With what really makes a rook is there's a king, a king man that makes an army, and it's he's a mafioso. He goes and beats up people that don't have any options to escape him, and so so the whole world now has no escape. Everybody is in that regime, but as the hunter gatherers will, have, you know, after the flipping, everybody will have an option. Everybody will will in a way, if they survive, the population density will be very thin, so nobody will be able to do. Robinson Crusoe because no, sl no slaves will stick around to be abused. And anybody that tries to do that, you see, they get away with it now because they have an army. They, we, see, they, all the security forces and stuff we have now are to secure property rights. And securing property rights is necessary for you to be a psychopath and uh, to exploit other people. So when, you know, it's going to be very difficult to keep a security force and an army and pay them. Because what are you going to pay them with? They always paid them with grain because it kind of worked. That grain's easy. Grain you can measure out. You can use it as a currency. And you can keep an army with it. And if you have grain, you automatically wipe out the ecosystem so that other people don't have options. But we, we saw this. And I know this for a fact because you can go back to South Africa's history. <laughs> which is where everything I, I get comes from. So the if you go back to South Africa, was, um, you have uh, hierarchies because uh, it's, it was kind of a dangerous place. So you have pastoralists, right? The, the whites coming up from the Cape, and then Dingan and Dingashweo and these guys, Zulus and stuff coming down. They're both pastoralists. They're both cattle farmers. Now, cattle farmers are bound to compete because the cattle need to graze and move on. There's not enough pasturage. So they're going to fight over the pasture. And that's exactly what happened. Just so happened that, you know, the, the guns won out narrowly, by the way. And then, uh, you see, what, what happened after that was then they discovered gold. Then they needed slaves. So the first thing you need to reconstruct civilization is slaves to go down the mines. No one wants to go down a mine to get your metal, Aaron. <laughs> so... So then uh, what they do is, is they try and get labor out of all these guys who now have been defeated. So if you're a cattle farmer, you know, you, you have vast herd of cattle because you're a big chief and you, you can afford to be a big man. But if you're defeated and you can no longer have a big herd because the white man now claims your land and drives you off into, into subsistence, then in subsistence, you're quite happy. You, you can actually have a couple of cows, a few goats. As long as you don't fuck with a white man, you, you can live, you know, in the sun very nicely in Africa. And that's what they all did. They went like, okay, that's the end of the big man game. Uh, let's go and be subsistence farmers. Now, the whites had a problem because they said like, well, we need some assholes to go down the mine to make us rich. And these guys sit in the sun all day and give us the finger when we try and tell them, hey, I have some white man money. <laughs> and they go like, what am I going to use it for? <laughs> and so they got them off the land, uh, mainly by taxes and getting them in the financial system. Uh, and that's how they got them down the mines. And then they were fucked. Uh, the population increased vastly after that. The, so that's that's the story. If you see the if, uh, if you want to be Jeff Bezos, okay, so you can't, you think of it, you go into space in your, you, in your little space colony, you can't stay there for long, like microgravity and stuff is eating away your bones, <laughs> you uh, just have a look at Biosphere 2, you, you can have a, like a terrarium or something, a kind of a little thing that works, but you're already getting into shit because you, your solar panels are going out and then you, you can't call the help desk because it's just ash down on Earth. So you've got to come down pretty fucking soon, right? Um, you can't stay up there for long. Um, look at the guys up on the space station. They fucked after being up there for those record amount of time. So by you the time you, you um, land on Earth, you put your rag on. Yeah. But, um, I, you know, I mean, you made the comment a couple of times before that one of the safest places to be uh, during the flippening is at sea. <clears throat> and I, I kind of started thinking, well, why are these fuckers spending so much money supposedly going into space to, to ride this out, this period out? Um, it would be cheaper for them to go for submarines or, you know, I mean, I, I suppose they have already. No, they are. You know, they are. Yeah, they are, are they? No, yeah. no, they are. Um, can I, um, yeah, are. <laughs> do you mind if I break the uh, the discussion there? 
Um, oh, no, just one word. No, just quick one word there. Yeah. Have, have a look. Have a look at all these guys doing undersea cities and oh, stuff okay. like that. There's right. a large contingent. You see, the, the, this is why I say is you mustn't listen to me too much. You must figure out your own thing because yeah. it's kind of like, okay, as the extinction army, we want somebody to survive. We want humanity to survive. Even if it's just... That's cool because he's he's Jeff Bezos is. I'm just saying. I uh, hope I got the point across that he's not going to survive long because he's thinking in terms of the alien cortex. The alien cortex was a product of civilization. It's a product actually of trade, and so these guys are not traders when they come back. So so really, our alien cortex, according to me, started about fifty thousand years ago, and it started because people started trading. What your alien cortex is, is a chess player. It's, it's fundamentally for the marketplace, and it's fundamentally for you to cheat a customer. So it's basically you have a zero-sum game in the marketplace. You have the, the shopkeeper, and you have the customer. And, it, and a fixed amount of money, that's the money in the customer's po pockets, and a fixed amount of goods, that's what's in the stall for the, 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 stock, uh, the shop owner. They're going to trade, but it's a zero-sum game. You know, Peter's loss is Paul's gain and vice versa. So out of that mentality, 50 years of that kind of horse trading is where our alien cortex comes from. I don't see any, if any of these guys set up a market stall, that's adversarial. I don't think they're going to make it. If, if Jeff Bezos comes back down and lands on Earth and thinks, right, I'm going to recreate Amazon. I'll set up a little market stall and stuff. He's going to get raided and he's going to get fucking roasted. So, he, he, you know, with it, it doesn't fit together, just like the industrial network and ecosystem doesn't fit together. His trading mindset doesn't fit together. So it's like, how do you keep a stall without an army? How do you, well, why doesn't the army take your shit? You know, it's, it's you, yeah, it's, uh, once you see it, you see that these guys might make it through. Maybe they will be, you know, Noah or something. But Noah's kids are going to be very fucking different. They're going to be completely different animals. Otherwise, they won't survive. In centuries past, mer merchants were it's the most wild segment of society. And it's, it's kind of weird today, but that's what they were. Yeah, all of it's done by merchants. Yeah, all of it's done by merchants. People don't see it. Historians don't see it much. But everything starts with commas. All the sea voyages, all the... Co uh, colonialism, everything, it's trade. They're all traders. And so it really, the Phoenicians are right? They're the very first guys to start going all over the world. What they're doing is arbitrage. They're going to the tin mines in Spain and, and, the, and the UK um, to kick off the Bronze Age. So, you know, without bronze, you can't get anywhere because the metals are too soft. But as soon as, as soon as they they strike, you know, figure out adding tin to copper, then then they're in the Bronze Age. The problem is the tin mines are only in like Cornwall, <laughs> up in Iberia. So that the, you need a you if you made that trip overland with a lump of metal, you, you wouldn't. <laughs> I mean, just imagine hauling that on a on a mule or on your back or something like a kilogram of metal. Need sea travel, and so the, the Phoenicians were pretty good uh, sea travelers, so they they could pull it off. But they they're doing arbitrage, right? They're getting tin, and then they go to some place with copper. And then both of those are not so valuable, but put them together, suddenly, oh, a huge amount of value. And also, the value of copper is you can break people's heads with it. But the, you know, that, uh, without the violence, and without the arbitrage, and without the trade, you can't do anything. So they're saying like after the flipping. None of that. What are you going to be fucking trading? <laughs> the things will be durable. It's like, it's like the Piraha. You know, the Piraha are not big traders because they don't have fridges, right? They don't have storehouses. You can't in the Amazon. You can't like get the fish that you stored today, stick it in the deep freeze, and take it down river to trade, right? Well, you you can now. That's what's fucking them up. But if the uh, you know before the white man gave them a fridge, uh, you know everything perishes after a day. So if actually our whole society could be saved if you just got rid of refrigeration. If, if you made everybody um, just, you know, give us this day our daily bread. If you made everything daily bread. So in other words, if you made all money 
last for one day and then it was worthless the next day that would actually save our society <laughs> but uh, what what they do is they they do that in effect right but the the, the lifespan of a dollar is, is much longer in the in the US the life dollar is probably a year in the UK the lifespan of a pound is probably five years and what that means is you know okay the whole economic system is just fake right they just pump a whole lot of tokens uh, into the system through the banks um, they give it out as debt and they don't give the interest which means they keep you running around that's the trick is they keep you running around trying to serve the debt um, and which they cleverly don't give you uh, they give you enough money for capital but uh, for the for the debt they don't give you enough uh, money in, they don't put enough money into the system to allow you to repay the debt so they don't have um, the interest payments are not put into the system and that's why they keep on stealing and growing that's the growth factor and so when they take it out they take it out through through inflation and they take it out through um through taxes so so you know they put it in here in the banks the banks give it to you as a loan you run around burning your ass off trying to repay the interest on that loan and in the meantime they gobble you up with tax and inflation oh. and that's the their big wheel so the wheel turns at about one one revolution uh, the velocity of a dollar is about one in 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 the states now but you, if you want to know what the economy is doing have a look at the velocity of the dollar they set the velocity of this big wheel exactly perfect for them to to capitalize on say a two percent growth rate and an interest rate which traditionally was about four percent so all the all the parasites that don't actually contribute anything and live on unearned income and have since the dawn of civilization they've traditionally done it between four and six aside out of us um, and that keeps the the civilization growing but let's so, let's so, add to the mental model though because uh, it, it's not just the parasites at the banking level and the rest of people it's the the investors and the 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 people who understand the system well enough to to do rental properties instead of living in the house they they have a mortgage on so there you 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 still don't have enough to pay it back yourself, but if you enslave other people to pay it back for you, then you've got the COPPA system, right? So it, and over the course of the, the investors, um, uh, you know, 30 year mortgage or whatever, you, you pay the bank double what the house was originally worth, right? So, but the investor makes profit all the, all the way down. It's just the, the people at the bottom that don't, uh, don't get ahead. Yeah, I, for, I forgot. There's actually three. I forgot rent. Yeah. So the what that that's how you keep slaves um, in say Egypt, right? Where guys don't have any options because you have a floodplain in the Nile Valley, desert on either side. So the the at the beginning after the younger dry, the the Sahara is actually fertile. So it civilization could only kick off when the deserts kicked in and then you couldn't you couldn't you you didn't have the option of opting out of civilization that allowed slavery so so uh, but the way you do it is uh, you you give people a little grub stake in the Nile Valley in the fertile valley um, and then you tax them so you you they pay rent um, and so they in effect peons and that's how you build per and get geometry started and arithmetic and stuff. Everything, geometry starts with geo means earth and metry is from metro measuring. So it's earth measuring. And so what are you measuring? You're measuring the little plot that you're going to give to the guy uh, so that he has to pay your rent. And then, then they start everything. I mean, they start monitoring the level of the Nile and stuff. And what, what they're doing there is they're deciding how much revenue they're going to get in the next year by the... How, depending on how much the, the Nile floods will be, how, how much alluvium is actually spread, and that'll determine how much grain the, the, the peons make. The grain will determine how big an army they can have. The army determines how big they can grow because they, they're growing by conquest. And so that's pretty much how civilization goes to this day. Now America just has perfected it, and they do that with the IMF. But the guys all behind it are, are financiers. They're BlackRock. Uh, State Street 
uh, all they became the hedge funds because the, the hedge funds uh, got into this thing where they they borrowed money to then do ra raids so they they the corporate raiders now own everything so they you know um all the kkk and um state street vanguard all of these hedge funds um since the 80s they took over the entire world they, so it's basically only three things blackrock uh, state street and vanguard are essentially own the world um and 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 determine everything that happens uh, so yeah sorry Sorry, liberals. Uh, I know that uh, you know you're, they told you in your bedtime stories that there are no conspiracies, but uh, it's time to wake up now. <laughs> that everything's a conspiracy. We're and, talking uh, about conspiracies. Um, we 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 had started the conversation about discrimination, and it was on the agenda of the of the meeting. Um, and you were saying you were talking about uh, uh, the video that somebody posted. I think it's you, Hugh, who posted the the David Icke one, and and then. Um, and uh, there was a comment um, uh, where there was another link to a video on YouTube of uh, David Icke being interviewed by the BBC when he was very young and how he was ridiculed by the by the media. And uh, I was I would just like to bring back the the subject of discrimination um, on, on and see what what anybody has to say about this, because it, it's uh, it's quite important to see. He has been totally I think that guy, even though I don't I, I, I think he's, he's a. <laughs> He's an interesting guy. He's got he's got visions. He's uh, well, why would he be shut down? And you know he has been totally shut down. Even though I I just don't understand all his reptilian stuff and all that, but he, he has he has actually been for, I think he's been deplatformed completely from uh, from YouTube, hasn't he? This year, I, I'm not too sure because I don't I don't know him very well. Yeah, because of yeah, it's because conspiracy theories now are put in this big you know kind of a uh, grad bag of uh, heresies and so you know it's the any uh, we're, we're at the point where we're trying to, to hold the old system together so it's this is what normally happens when you hit a revolution is the ancient race to consolidate then you have a lot of these um things where people trying to go back in time trying to turn back the clock a lot of references to history a lot of appeal to the ages all of this kind of thing and you have a lot of scapegoating uh, so they always find heretics and then you have a list of what heretics have and it's kind of like uh, anybody that's unorthodox because you're trying to hold on to orthodoxy you're trying to hold on to this dying system and so anybody that's you know disparages this system anybody that's anarchic and anybody that's heterodox suddenly becomes a real real threat now it turns out that the biggest conservatives are liberals. The left and the liberal, the left is ultra conservative now, because they they try they're the house slaves trying to hold on to the plantation. So it's ironic that the people that are supporting the the plantation most now are are the liberals, uh, the house slaves. And the reason is because they don't they don't want to lose their position in the house, and they can see people are starting to burn down the plantation. So they're running around saying, don't. You know, to prosecute people that are, are defecting from the system, Pro prosecute people that don't believe in the system, prosecute heterodox ideas. Pro so it's all, you know, look, guys, we believe in progress. We believe in humanitarian ideals. It's like save the enlightenment. It's Steven Pinker. Save the enlightenment. It's the house slave saying save the plantation, save the plantation. Why? Because we made out like bandits in the old days in the plantation. But... You see, so David Icke or, and us as the Extinctionati, and anything that the Extinctionati does is, will be put in this camp. We'll be driven towards the right because the, 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 the house slaves have said, you know, anybody on the right is a conspiracy theorist. So therefore, you know, anything to do with conspiracy, no matter what, whether it's to do with the pandemic, whether it's to do with JFK, is, is immediately ridiculed sidelined, cancelled, deplatformed, because um, yeah, they need orthodoxy and they, they need, uh, the, the one thing the, the left always wants is consensus and uniformity. So there's this huge lamenting all the time that, oh, there's division, oh, woe is me, oh, there's division and stuff. And so like, it, increasingly the number of people that just want to burn the shit down is growing. And they can't do anything about that except you know, kind of uh, persecute them. And it, when they persecute them, 
they accelerate the process. So that's what I'm trying to say to people. Don't worry about this authoritarian and the pandemic. It's great. The system needs to be burnt down. The more, <laughs> you know, it's been, so, so like if they ban you from restaurants for being anti-vax or something, it's like, it's like, you know, what, not anti-vax, authoritarian. But the more authoritarian they get, the, the more that you make a second class citizen, the more that you make uh, radical people that are self the more, you see, there's this infantile idea that you can just shut somebody up, particularly on the left. They think, shut you up. It's this kind of patronizing Karen, Martin, you know, mommy thing, um, where you have this kind of school mom thing. And the, because the left is all infantile, then they think in terms of like, school kids and so they think like teacher can shut you down put you in the corner and so they think that they can do this to a whole class of people and they think that when people are deplatformed they just go oh i'm so i'm so you know distraught that i've been ostracized and put on the fringe i want to be back with all all you wonderful white you know house slaves and it's like no they don't they fucking angry so everything they're doing is showing up a backlash. I mean, just look at the woke. Just just look at the stuff they're doing, like critical race theory, teaching it to kids in school. And then, you know, oh, you're going to shut down the Nazis. Because one thing about Nazis is as soon as you can't cancel and deplatform them, they go and sit in the corner and they're very contrite. Do they do that? Or do they come back and slaughter your fucking little sheep's neck? Of course they come back. And there's a backlash and you see it now you're going to see it in 2022 you're going to see trump elected in 2024 they're going to they're going to re-elect a fucking dictator and and the, that's the way your freedom yeah. goes is by shutting down other people's freedom but it's good it's good for us because it basically it makes radicalizes people look at the progress over this pandemic People went from like completely complacent thinking, you know, talking about 2100 and, how, you know, climate change is the name, you know, about all about the children and how all this horseshit has all been swept away now. Now everybody is like, oh, the system is fragile. This shit does happen. Yeah, just like we told you, idiots, and it's going to get a lot worse. Um, can, I, can we just go back a, a little bit to uh, discrimination? <clears throat> um, because uh, when I first suggested that to you, I used the word discernment. Um, although if you go and look, uh, they're, they're usually, uh, you know, they're closely connected terms. Um, what I was trying to get to was, <clears throat> for instance, if you uh, come across David Icke for the first time, and uh, there's, you know, you can read through his stuff and you could imagine some people being uh, not having very much background and and not quite sure which way to take it or whether this is all just complete nonsense or whether there's something in here worth listening to or not. Um, but it occurred to me that that uh, sometimes when you're trying to navigate uh, uh, peculiar messages like that, uh, that you do have to rely on something within yourself that uh, doesn't have all the facts available and all the knowledge and background to enable you to make these so-called informed decisions, um, that you're relying on something else, that you're relying on a kind of a an intuition or a, a sense of smell or something about uh, whether this is entirely rubbish or whether it's actually trying to say something and it's just doing it in a peculiar way. Um, um, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that some people seem to be missing that faculty. They, they don't seem to be able to be, how, how can I put it, non-academically critical. Um, you, you see, we're always expected to keep our mouths shut unless we can be academically critical, unless we can cite all the references and the the the, the, the uh, you know previous publications and essays that have been written on this subject. And if you can't do that, you're supposed to just shut up and and you're supposedly not able to make up your own mind and think for yourself. Um, but I think um, people can still make up their minds and, and navigate this. And I guess that was the point I was making, that they 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 have, not, not everybody, but I think 
some people uh, have a have you know just what I called a sense of discernment that there was they could navigate without um, getting themselves completely misled um, in the in the absence of having all of the necessary background information available because you know you don't always have that anyway. Um, it was more the angle I was taking on it, but I, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. So my interpretation of David, like what he's doing is art. So he's representing the four, the four other layers uh, and cutting across the alien cortex. So the alien cortex has control in our world. It thinks it does. <laughs> it's deluding itself. But the reason why you have to keep everything intellectual and you know, evidence-based and scientific is because it's a tyranny of the alien cortex. Artists and shamans, renegades, confront the alien cortex with its own inconsistencies and incompleteness. So the, that's what Ike is doing. He's, he's speaking from the four other layers. So what, what he does is, is art. And so uh, that's the way the four other layers talk to the alien cortex. It's, it's their language. So, so David Icke had a psychotic break. He, you know, at the time of Wogan, he, he was psychotic. Um, and so he was roundly disparaged. But you see, uh, that psychosis is it was a kind of you psychosis it is the breaking of his rational faculty. So in other words, he broke through rationality. Uh, of course, he got laughed at straight away because you know, we're, we're hyper rational in our culture. So but what he's doing is a kind of a Jackson Pollock. So he presents all of this stuff. It's all, you know, weird shit it's kind of uh, surreal content of his uh, four other brain layers so it looks like dali it looks like uh, a surrealist painting that he's painting in words it appeals to people because the four in his other brain layers are screaming that there's something wrong there's something fishy in the state of denmark so uh, you know it does where the wires cross is, is you mentioned the phrase making making up your mind and that is exactly what we're doing we're making up the emperor's new mind and so the four brain are integrating with the the alien cortex that's what happens on the other side of you you psychosis why it's so traumatic is because the alien cortex doesn't want to cede control so if you if you see okay again sorry to go back to south africa but the de Klerk died recently. The the big thing about de Klerk was he represents the alien court of the Afrikaners, as weird as they were, <laughs> uh, represented in this analogy anyway, the alien cortex in South Africa. And and so de Klerk, why he de Klerk is great, possibly greater than um, than Mandela, is because he ceded power. He ceded control and power. Uh, and so that that's what the alien cortex needs to do to pass through. So, uh, so South Africa's experience and liberation in South Africa was very much a kind of matter for the psychological transformation that Ike went through and every shaman goes through through you psychosis. So South Africa went through a psychosis. The reason why it didn't tip over to destruction is because of Mandela and de Klerk, but particularly de Klerk, because he represent he played the role alien cortex that gave up. But he's, here's the thing: is it, he didn't give up out of weakness. He gave up out of, in control. So, so when he gave up and ceded, he did it as, as a rational and and avoided suicide of the country. So that's that's what these people are doing. See. Ike has a real problem after he, you know, goes through his eupsychosis and becomes, uh, com you know, just terribly vilified um, uh, in in Britain. He has to reassemble everything and and then start to reinterpret the contents that of his new brain. His new brain now has the four other layers in ascendancy, and the alien cortex is is now the servant in the McGilchrist kind of way. So the ma so. The, you know, the master, everybody's master is the alien cortex in our culture. And in, in I get subordinated. Uh, so, and that is how it gets integrated. So I can represents a new mindset and a new making up of the mind. 
And McGilchrist is also hedging, hinting. Uh, McGilchrist doesn't understand, as far as I can see, about transformation and the eu psychosis and the value of it. I was very disappointed to see that thing about where where uh, McGilchrist responded to a defense of poetry and that. And you can clearly see that I, I get the impression that, that McGilchrist has gone psychotic and hasn't integrated it properly. He still has loyalties to the alien cortex. The alien cortex is not subordinated in him. Um, so he, he's kind of like a half poor, half poor. He's, he's kind of like a failed transformation. Well, he, um, I mean, he's, so he's, he's still in But he's deeply, so um, he's still half -baked. he's deeply embedded in academia and, and, and a lot of conventional, yeah. Uh, that's the problem. He you know, I mean, it's because he's whole. So in other words, yeah. he can't give up the room. Right? I mean, he's he can't, he can't like, get out the pot. He's still in the crucible, right? He can't. He can't finish yeah. off. But I mean, I mean, he's a little bit like people in uh, physics and science who, who uh, observe strange behaviour in in subatomic particles, and uh, you know they can't see that they're the. Uh, well, how it sounds corny. I mean, they, they can't see that it's demonstrating some fundamental spiritual things to them. You know, um, they want to lapse back into a, into a scientific interpretation. Um, yeah, there's, you... a, there's a lot of things. Uh, well, well, let me let me talk about this. Though there, there's a lot. Uh, the thing about discrimination and and discernment is. Um, it's always pointed at in the esoteric traditions as discrimination between the real and the unreal. So what Miguel Christens people are doing is they're going back to the unreal. So he keeps on going back to academia, can't, can't leave it alone. So if you, if you look at Jung, he also went through a psychotic break, which he couldn't, as a, you know, as a famous psychiatrist, he couldn't go and tell all his his, you know, his buddies that um, psychosis is actually a good thing. The thing that you fear most is actually a good thing. I mean, you can't tell that to psychiatrists. They, you know, well, thank you, mad. <laughs> so they they petrified of psychosis, and but uh, they've usurped the positions of shamans in our society. So they're supposed to usher you through the delusion to the real, and so. Discrimination, if you see in the Bhagavad Gita, all of these great writings and that, they say it's discrimination, the, the real from the unreal. So to get straight to the spirituality of it is like what's real and what's unreal. Now, if you're still stuck in the alien cortex, you're talking this kind of pigeon, uh, this kind of kitchen version of uh, language. You, you have a vocabulary of the guys in the you know, prison yard. So the, then what's real is, well, facts are real. Um, you know, stuff David Icke says is not real and doing all of that. And so, uh, but that's not what they're saying. They're saying that uh, you can sweep it all aside, go to first principles and say, it's all unreal. Only one thing that's real, and that's the self with a capital S. So it's kind of like Descartes. You don't want to be a dualist, but if you're a non you know. Descartes was a dualist. He thought you had a soul and stuff, but it's like there's nothing like that. But the uh, if you say uh, from the point of view of best that the sages could come up with in India and all around the world and the Aryans and all of those guys, they said the only thing real is the observer. We 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 keep on rediscovering that. We read that in quantum physics and stuff is again and again. The Copenhagen interpretation and all of these things they come back to this. Ancient thing. That's why they had they wrote the dancing wooly masters and stuff. Who wrote that? Wheeler or somebody. But all of those guys uh, eventually come back to esoteric Hinduism and stuff like that because they're saying what is real. It's like only the observation, the measurement. Think about it. Your own life. All you know. You could be having a dream. You could be in a simulator. You could be in a computer program. You could be in the metaverse. It, this could be entirely constructed, and it is. It is. It's constructed by the prima mater, by the the thing. It's you. You're literally observing a an illusion. Right? I'm I'm an 
television. You're listening to me here. It's all bits and bytes. It's basically pixels on the screen. It's a crafty, you know, conjured illusion. So you say, well, what what is real? You say, all, all of it's unreal. It's here today, gone tomorrow. So the only thing that is real is the self, the observer. So are there more than one self? Are there lots of observers? No, they can't be. So that that's the hard truth at the core of all of this. This one. So what they're saying, uh, the, the guru, the shaman, the rebirth that they're talking about is a rebirth from the unreal to the real. And the, the real is that the observer exists and you're it. So it's a conundrum. You say like, well, are there 7.8 billion observers? Nah. <laughs> there might be 7.8 billion perspectives, but there's only one observer. So, yeah. Do you, do you want... Yeah. I'm just wondering, I'm just caught in a crossroads here to go deeper into this. Um, um, one thing that Krishnamurti asserted very, um, uh, well, very assertively, um, was that the observer and the observed were not, uh, were one thing. That there was not, not a, no separate observers. There's no separation. It's the same thing. I, I mean, I can appreciate that he probably is meaning that in a different sense to what you've just been saying now. Um, no, but, no uh, not at all. It's a, I mean it in exactly his sense. Yeah. 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 No, I just. See, just what I think you see. You see, you see we, we fundamentally have a science has taken us down a, a false path. You see, so. And that the reason science is unraveling. We're we're at the end of science now. I've said a number of times the James Webb telescope. When that goes up, we'll get our last look at deep space. We'll get our last time to question the, the universe in this way. Uh, hunter gatherers and the you know our future selves, uh, you know, back to monkey. We're not going to look at the sky in the same way. We're not going to look at the very big and the very small in the same way. So we get a fantastic opportunity now to have our last glimpse and ask our last questions. I'll tell you right now, <laughs> they're going to be unresolved because there's an infinite horizon. We'll, we'll just get to look at the horizon just before we fall off the ladder and fall back. Uh, we get a look over the, over the wall in, into this vista that just goes on forever. So I have a, a great, great hopes for general because like Apollo 8, we don't get to look at the heavens, we get to look at ourselves, we get to look at what we're doing in science. And it is a fundamental mistake that physics, particularly Einstein, is guilty of this. And, and Newton, they all contributed to it, but to, to leading us up the garden path, it's the alien cortex trying to substitute um, the unreal for the real, and they did a good job, though it's coming unstuck now at the end of science. Uh, they start the lie is being revealed, and so what the lie is is it's it's hard to describe in words, but you can see it in in quantum physics and stuff. And it, the best way I can quickly get the uh, to for so everybody could understand is if you look at the point of view of light. Uh, let's just pretend that the prima mater everything is just energy, and like light is a great form of energy because most of the shit we see about, over like part from the of radiation and stuff, is electromagnet. You say it's all about electromagnetism. Maybe there aren't any quarks. Maybe it's just you know folded up bits of electromagnetism. It's basically they just little. You have a big field and you have a little knot, and that's what the particle is. It's a kind of self-acting. It's kind of like a toroid or something like that. Maybe that's what the electron is. Like but a tapestry. Thing, is we have this illusion. That the, yeah, or, or just a tapestry, but more than a tapestry because it's fractal. It's, it's uh, you know, you can you can drill down on it. It's not flat. It's a three-dimensional three topology. See, what there aren't, there are only three dimensions, right? So we made a big mistake with going to 11 dimensions and stuff. It's all, it's kind of an, a, uh, an indication of our misunderstanding. But if you if you go down to what what it is for light is you can see it you can see it in a, a you know like a Bell inequality and you put a split uh, split mirror and look at all you know all this kind of quantum reality the double split experiment and stuff what it's saying is 
that there is no locality for light. So, so we, we set up a, a double split experiment and we say like, oh, you see, over here it does this and you know you interrogate here it does that and then you get spooky action and the distance and stuff and you say like no they the they know that it's like non-locality for, for light doesn't see it your way it sees everything compressed with lorentz um lorentz compression so that it's it's the same place light, light says your a you know hundreds of kilometers over here where the laser hits is exactly the same as B, where you send the other beam off from this, you know, beam splitter into B. To light, A and B are in exactly the same place. And we say, but they're hundreds of miles different. And you say, yeah, that's the illusion. The illusion of the space between A and B. It's a kind of weird thing that, you know, we as um, kind of seven foot entities in, of this scale, we, we're in this uh, illusion, uh, but light doesn't have it. Light doesn't say that the, universe is 14.7 billion it says no we're still in the big bang here it says um, that it's still over and over. if you go down a black hole they're not separate everybody thinks oh there's a black hole at the center of each one of these galaxies they say no nah, it's the same black hole <laughs> if you if you go into it you reach a singularity and the singularity by definition has no dimensions and it has no no properties so it's like they're all the same they're all the same singularity and you say ah oh, yeah but then so then you have all of them are the same singularity all at the middle of each one of these galaxies yeah except the universe the expanding universe the hubble universe also that singularity so you if you can imagine this you go sinking down a black hole when you get to the singularity at the center of the black hole you emerge on the you know the edge of glory and the kind of edge where there is no edge right it's not a balloon expanding we, we are in the singularity in this space so the you, the universe just heat on the on the observable universe yeah. yeah the universe doesn't recognize displacement which is what our language does well well light itself is we we uh, don't see light as it is. We see light as a displacement. So we see basically, and it displaces at the permittivity and permeability limit of, of free space. But you can see there's something we're doing fundamentally wrong. And so yep. the, the way to do it is say, why why is the permittivity of free space what it is? Oh, the exact values it, it takes and, the, and, and permeability is like, wh why is it impossible to have an electric field without, without having a corresponding transverse um, uh, magnetic field. And say, so like, we, we're kind of uh, doing what the Hindus said in, you know, with the alphabet, the, the Sanskrit alphabet. It's like, we're splitting, It's it, we are saying, you know, if you do electrical impulse thing, you will get, you must get a transverse Magnetic impulse, and that, that's, it's a kind of, it all sums to zero, it's all in max versions and stuff, and we just can't see it. We're still trapped in this delusion that this that there is actually some space between point A and point B. It's like, well, there is Here. time, but it's, time comes about because kind of trying to resolve A and B is kind of like a, it's a like Remember, it's, let's pretend, Distance is, is different from this distance, and that's the game we're playing, and that's yeah. the illusion. Hugh, can I uh, just suggest something that it, it's a little bit like this? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, you know, where you can determine the position of a particle and not its velocity, or, or the velocity and not the, the position. Um, you know, so as soon as you try to particularize, something gets lost. Um, and you, you can't do the two. And I'm wondering whether, you know, just to go back to what you said earlier about only the self is real and and the, um, the, the only thing that's real is the observer. Um, but observation is an experience. Um, and I, I just looking, because, you know, we brought up time and space. Um, so if the observer... Uh, will necessarily have an experience, but an experience requires time and space in which to 
exist. If there wasn't time and space, it wouldn't be there. In other words, if we're going to uh, experience something, we must be we must be in time and space in order to do it, and that enables us to be the observer. And if the uh, so there wasn't time and space, there would be no observer. We, we would sort of collapse back into, uh, um, well, I don't know what, you know, singularity, I, I don't know. I, I think this is the, 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 the sort of conundrum of the universe or the conundrum of God. If, if God wants to experience something or himself, he has to uh, create a limitation in a way uh, or, or divide off somehow. Um and you know the the the, the sort of uh, price you pay for being limited to time and space is that suddenly you can have an experience, uh, whereas if you're not uh, caught in that, if you're not limited to that, that's fine. But you're not going to be particular enough to have an experience or be an observer. You, you're just part of the entire whatever you want to call it. You know this great matrix of of of, um, of um, fractality. Um, so I, I mean, and I think the uh, the Hindu thing does go into that. I, I guess, in a way, the um, the, uh, the you know the idea of uh, yeah, it 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 does. It's it does, but they they went into it in a way that you know made sense of sages in the forest and you know talking to an audience. Um, but the yeah, for the physics point of view, the it takes time, you say. It ta uh, observation takes time, and so uh, it's uh, why we kind of at the edge of physics is because the you know the uh, an observation is really a co collapse of the wave packet. So basically, high you know Schrodinger's uh, psi, the wave equation. So when the wave equation collapses, that's that's an observation. Now, the where we at the limit of science is that. I think in the Copenhagen interpretation and Niels Bohr's, they said, well, the ha collapse has to happen instantly without time. Again, it's that kind of thing we were talking about before with the square wave that's impossible and uh, the continuous universe. The, it's kind of the universe is not, not discrete and it's not continuous either. Um, we keep on flip-flopping between the two, you know, just um, like... Uh, like poor old um, uh, what's his name who who went mad um, uh, trying to you know with a continuum hypothesis trying to prove it you can prove it one way or another we we kind of uh, get stuck in a Cantor yeah so Cantor uh, so Cantor went and drove himself mad doing exactly the way physicists are driving themselves mad <laughs> now is is saying the collapse of the wave packet is instantaneous well it can't be. Okay, you know, it, it appears to be a jump, but but why? It, it's like maybe you could slow it down and see the continuous, me, you know, mechanics of you know the wave function. And they say no, because if you did that, that would mean the hidden variables. It would mean there were there were you know things that you could work with where you could describe the collapse of the wave packet um, in you know in slow motion. And, so, and you say, no, you've got two pictures. It's like this, and then observation, collapse, um, or collapse, and then the, that amounts to an observation. And you say, there's only those pictures. They jump, you know, and uh, like Fermi exclusion principle is like, say like that that quantum leap is uh, is all. You say, there's nothing in between A and B. And you say like, eh, bullshit. <laughs> That's what's getting us wrong. Is that from state one to state two, there's a transition, uh, but we think of transitions as either continuous, so in other words, it's face sense, or otherwise the Copenhagen interpretation, which is like a step, and you're not, you're not allowed intermediates. You know, so, like, come on, dude, it's, you, you, both of those are wrong. They got, <laughs> yeah. and we're, we're stuck on the, that fork there. But, Somewhere in there is the ob observation of what's really going on um, in, in terms of the entire universe. Every everything in the universe, everything you know, <clears throat> photon that you can see, and everything you might as well assume is a is a collapse of the wave packet. And then you know, then you confuse yourself even more, thinking, well, well how do you get um, you know basically these things getting superpositions and being 
crippled and things like that. And you say, it's all more of an expression of our ignorance that, you know, that it, it fundamentally the, the discrete and the continuous are, are both incorrect. And that's what we can't get our head yeah. around. Because, yeah, and, and the reason why we can't get our head around is because we, we are discrete. The, the alien cortex is discrete. It is, you know, it neurons fire. We are fundamentally, it's like discrete cannot stand continuous. And continuous can't understand discrete. And so it's like the fact. But go ahead, Ryan. Yeah. Um, so a few things to say. Um, one is I put in chat uh, that you won't know, learn this in school, but there is only one Maxwell's equation. You said Maxwell's equations. They don't teach this in school, but um, yeah, it's delta, uh, delta or uh, gradient of f equals j over uh, c epsilon, so zero. So that's uh, that's way more concise, and um, it's because we we use the wrong path in mathematics to get uh, linear algebra um, from from Clifford algebra that are like a bifurcating two different paths in mathematics and one became dominant in academia. And that one fails to um, uh, speak to nature in the same way. Uh, so it's, uh, this is the, the, the truth here. Um, and our, uh, our four Maxwell's equations is an artifact of our, our poor mathematics. Um, the second is, yeah. uh, in terms of the mathematics, the the neither smooth nor uh, like this is the, the the difficulty we're having with the unification of um, uh, general relativity and, and quantum is is that discrete versus continuous type of uh, dynamic, and where if, uh, if you have integer dimension, then you have like a a, a smooth um, you can have a smooth system but uh fractal dimension is often like uh a um a non-integer dimension so uh like two point you know, like square root of two dimension um something like that uh where it's not uh like an a, an example there is like the serpinski's triangle it's um it's more than a line and less than the plane right and um and in those cases, you end up sometimes with fractals that have smooth regions and also uh, chaotic regions where you get things like these uh, that the quantum, uh, you know, uh, things popping in and out of existence, like just right next to each other. And and I think that we, we do the math uh, on, you know, the constraints of the universe to get things like the, the Planck length and things like that. But where where I think we're not really uh, thinking well about it is that just by saying we know what the smallest thing in the universe has to be, and it, it can't be any smaller than that, um, it doesn't mean it's tiled in a grid, right? That's alien cortex thinking. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. yeah, no, no, I, I entirely agree. So, uh, yeah, that's why I keep on coming back to the fractal universe, because I think we collapse of the wave packet is they're missing. I mean, Feynman said, you know, integrals over all paths and stuff like that. And then, so if you do an integral over all paths, just hold that thought in mind, then you can see that the transition of the wave packet, the collapse of the wave packet must be fractal because you must be able to interrupt it at some point in the transition. And you'd say, well, then it would be two discrete steps. And you say, no, it's, it's still fractal. It's still you could you could still then it's like Zeno's paradox you could keep on splitting the transition, and you would still see that you know all all the sums work out they still come to, you know, a unit Planck length, but the the Planck length could be split I think and so you and and infinitely you could just just carry on doing it but the yeah I um I must say Ryan I'm really indebted to you for that. So. The thing, the single equation for Maxwell's equation. I, you know, Maxwell. Just for everybody who doesn't know what Maxwell's equations are, Maxwell was the genius that you mistakenly think Einstein is. <laughs> Einstein's a dullard, and Maxwell was a genius. But for, because of the times, uh, you know, the political times and the First World War and the, the zeitgeist of the time, we remember Einstein and, and forget uh, James Clerk Maxwell, which is, he's far more of a genius than Einstein. But, but, but 
so just uh, going through the the question that you put up the um run so so what what let's just see what so what this is 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 delta f so the the force right the change in force it's, is it's a gradient of the speed of light it's a gradient of f so it's the the, the um, oh okay like, it's a field rather than so change. the slope of f no it's not a slope ah, okay so, so the well, slope of f yeah wait say that again so think of it like a vector field. Uh, so gradient is like where where is pointing at all all points in the in F. Like uh, whereas uh, delta F would be the slope of F if F was a line, right? But the gradient of F is like a weather weather map with the where the where the where the wind is blowing, like the little arrows. Yeah, yeah. In the field. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so, so at, at any point, the the vector field is is joules uh, divided by the speed of light and the permittivity of free space. I think J is so, um, uh, charge and current rather than joules. It's not joules. No, it's not. Oh, it's a. It's a. Okay. So charge, charge and current. Yeah. Is it, the, is, a, a is a vector the, the speed, speed time, of light at one zero. Yeah, yeah. There's there's speed of light in there. I think. Um, uh, the, but yeah, the, um, yeah. J is a vector in space time representing the charge and current. F is a bivector. Uh, a bivector is is uh, kind of like a parallelogram in space rather than just an arrow in space, um, and. Uh, it represents the magnetic field, electromagnetic field. So um, it it's the relationship between charge and current and the electromagnetic field. But uh, so Maxwell didn't know about bivectors, right? Is that, uh, no, that's why he probably didn't do this. Is that right? No, he didn't do this. This he was, know, was David has in the 1970s. No, no, I'm saying Maxwell didn't know about bivectors, so that's why he didn't do this, right? He, he, he I don't think he knew about bivectors. Right? Uh, he may have, he may have known about it, but didn't put it in that formalism. But it's a, uh, uh, it's a uh, recent, recent development. Basically, all of all of physics can be represented in this uh, geometric algebra. Um, yeah, it's there's a book called Space Time Algebra. That um, David Hestinus wrote that does all of calculus, all of general relativity in in geometric algebra, and it's everything simplifies out. At the very fundamental layers, you have um, basic uh, things in quantum physics also draw out just from the identities in geometric algebra, um, like the I think the poly, poly matrices or something is just from a basic. Um, uh, uh, identity in in this, and one of the early identities is uh, using complex numbers where the fractals come through, right? So if you're there's there's like Mandelbrot sets. Which, which was that? Um, so uh, it, it essentially the um, which identities? So the the identities in terms of um, the there's the unit bivectors. So there's um, there's like if you think of in terms of the unit vectors uh, in a in Cartesian coordinates, you'd have like an arrow for x, y, and z, and then the unit bivectors are like the planes for x, y, z, z, x, and y, z, right? Those are the bivectors. The unit bivectors that when you do the do the geometric product uh, or the wedge product on them, they they just they have anti commutativity. So like this times that equals negative one, or this times itself equals negative one. So that's I right there. That's the imaginary numbers. And that's, you know, really fundamental uh, to rotations and everything. So th this math is also computationally more efficient than our regular math, because you can do any rotation by doing two different flip, flippings, <laughs> two different flips in uh, a across a, a plane. And it's it's more efficient than uh, we do things in computers today. So um, if uh, if Maxwell had seen this, 
he, he it would have been obvious to him, right? He would have uh, he, he would have said, "Yeah, I mean, that's what I was trying to say, right?" Wouldn't he? I I don't know. I think he definitely would. I mean, if he saw this, he would probably you know shit himself um, from how excited, and he probably wouldn't come down for a week, or he'd be kicking himself that he didn't see it earlier. <laughs> but um, but yeah, this is this is probably one of the yeah, most. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get to. Is is yeah, I, I, it's it's mind blowing. But the, you see that that's what I'm trying to get to in a way. Is so so just in case people don't know, is that uh, physicists are all liars, by the way, and mathematicians are too. They they always intuit this grand vision. And then they work out, basically, they formalize it with uh, uh, with mathematics or something like that, and then present it and hide all the scaffolding. So all their work and the insight that got them there, they hide it and pretend that they, they did all the crap, you know, calculations that they put down on the final paper. They pretend that that was how they got to it, where everybody knows that was a fucking lie. It's just a kind of explanation of the insight that they had. And, and so my, what's interesting is, yeah, back in Maxwell's day in the 19th century, they didn't hide it all that much. They didn't hide their workings and their kind of thought process, which now Maxwell would be roundly ridiculed for. But, but he published exactly what his thinking was. And he said, okay, take the shit that we know. We've got Coulomb's force and we know they're probably these little spinners going on. So he said, you know, imagine a free space is all these little tops spinning like this. And then, and he worked it all out like that, which is exactly what physicists do, but pretend they don't know. And, and so, but he left it all of this amazing kind of very physical model, you know, kind of Rube Goldberg thing that eventually it all comes together in his, uh, in his four equations. But um, just absolutely remarkable, just in case you, in case you're not in awe of Maxwell, uh, uh, Maxwell basically worked out that electro, the electric force and the magnetic force were essentially the same thing. So he unified them. And like with a paper and pencil, just you know, using kind of a lab bench that is in your high school, he, he figured out uh, basically how fast an uh, electromagnetic wave would move. And then it just so it turned out that it was close to what they had just meant, the speed of light. So he said, well, light must be uh, light must be an electromagnetic wave. So the little thing that makes a compass needle move, dink, 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 like that. And the mysterious force that Faraday was demonstrating at the Royal Institute, which we now think of as the electric force. He just unified them one day and then said, and by the way, that means that light is an electromagnetic wave. And people say, what, light reacts to magnets? What the fuck are you talking about? And he said, oh, yeah, but just in case that's not enough, um, uh, that almost also must imply that there's a whole electromagnetic spectrum and, um, you know, there must be radio waves too. So in like with a pencil and paper, Maxwell <laughs> worked out, he unified electromagnetic magnetism figured out that electromagnetic and said like and invented radio almost like in an afternoon <laughs> and he said like i'll give you a pencil and paper and say see how far you get down that road <laughs> take you it would have taken einstein a million years to come up with half of that but we don't remember that and then uh, this thing where, uh, but then uh, i yeah he came up with four fundamental equations the maxwell's fa famous equations but I, I always had the impression that you must be able to actually, unify them. Um, actually, I, I think he started with. Uh, until uh, me um, this, I, never knew. I think Maxwell's original equations were like 10 of them. And then later on, like in physics textbooks, they were able to simplify to four. But, but yeah, this, it actually simplifies down to something, you know, that I put in chat, right? Like three different terms and a constant. Um, it's it's hyper hyper elegant and it, but I, yeah. I think that it's this this there's so much uh left to discover in it i think if you know various people have said that you know it, it the particle universe it was a mistake the standard model is bullshit and doesn't really hold together even though that's celebrated so much it's kind of overhyped um and I, I think a lot of people, like um, Max, uh, Lord Calvin, 
and others, De Broglie and all these guys, they, they said that it's, it's just one force. Energy is just really a, call it electromagnetism. And everything is, is, uh, is made out of that. So the electron and the positron and the, uh, you know, they aren't quarks. You know, the, the neutron and the proton are actually just this kind of, they, they, they were going down this path of thinking them like smoke rings, you know, kind of twists in the, in the electromagnetic field. And uh, it, it got left behind um, that that kind of thinking. But the various people have come back and said it's all the same thing. And I, I always thought, yeah, that's they're on the right path. They should go back and look at that stuff, uh, as Calvin and all those forgotten guys said. But undergraduate physicist students, they, they keep on coming up with these papers that say, guys, it's all the same thing. You don't you don't need quarks and all this bullshit and uh, four you know now five fundamental forces and so they're all the same uh gravity and all of them they're all and uh, like you can uh, but it's not taken seriously partly because of all these greats all these greats stand in the way of progress they you know all the, they, these guys are are too iconic now to to criticize it's just a you know it, it's basically we, we're caught in our conservatism and can't can't break through um, in physics, but anyway, it's 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 kind of it's it's very moving because we, I think we're at the end of physics. We, we're at the end. Of this we kind of just saw, caught a glimpse of it, just as civilization ends. And hunter gatherers are not going to investigate things this way. <laughs> Use reason and stuff, and and I think this will all soon be forgotten. So everything we've achieved, a remarkable century in the twentieth century. Um, has to be given up and you have to wave it goodbye. Part Here, of the grief of, uh, of waving goodbye to civilization. But I'm wondering whether that's that's maybe not quite so dire because just to go back what you said a little while ago about um, about Maxwell having his original insight uh, and then rendering it in in mathematics um, uh, is that you know in a way he does people that process does a disservice to people because it it removes it from the realm of communicating it to most people because you you you're then transferring it into a highly specialized privileged language that only the high priests of science can can follow um and so what you've done is taken a story which could be uh, expressed uh, as, as the kind of, uh, um, I don't know what you might call it, is scientific mythology, um, uh, uh, which could have given people a, more generally an apprehension of what reality is like. But then when you want to... Uh, oh, oh much to, worse than that. Yeah, well, this is what I'm saying. No, no, no much, much worse than that. You see, well, much worse than that. You see, what, what, what is done is 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 given rise to, um, you know, generations of mechanics. So, so what what happens today in physics is they they just mess with the essentially the language of mathematics, and they don't have any insight anymore. So, the very few people that have Maxwell type insights. I, is Einstein fell into this trap is in his later life he just you know started you know rearranging symbols so in other words it, it kind of turns mathematics into this kind of Kabbalah where they think you know there's some beauty and symmetry and stuff in the mathematics and they forget that the mathematics is just a language to describe the universe and they start thinking it's you know the the wisdom is in the la the language itself so they start messing with the kind of grammar so it's in kind of they kind of want to get back to shakespeare by arranging the grammar very cleverly so i think if we just get the grammar right um and so it's in a, in other words it's become that's why they get uh, bamboozled by things like ai because they say well we can just get ai put all the symbols in there and let the ai fuck around until the ai comes with, up with genius stuff just by rearranging them and say no you're not going to get there that way because that's not how the fundamental insights were got the fundamental insights were got by a flash of intuition 
of how the the universe actually works yeah which was then expressed in mathematics that, that's what i'm so saying they, this they is what... now they just 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 rearranging words in effect and then and, and trying to get insights it's like that's absolutely yeah, back to front. front that's why physics is fucked yeah. today yeah didn't they call that like physics intuitive Christ, mathematics. all little science is on crisis yeah, but it's it, mathematicians and scientists have fallen foul of this. We've been bamboozled by by our own uh, mechanism, right? So it's in a way, it's a kind of thing exactly like AI. It's 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 worship of of the language and sort of uh, the yeah, that yeah. you're trying to express with the language. Yeah, it's a worship. We made our own the demon, map. You know? Yeah, it's worshiping the map instead of the terrain. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it's idolatry. It's it's idolatry. Is like, um, you know the these guys you know, made these statues to say it's it's kind of like you know Michelangelo made the David to to express uh, an insight into a perfection of humanity, and everybody starts wor worshiping the statue and saying like you know well maybe we can make a a statue exactly like it and then be Michelangelo and say no it's upside down dude. Back to front, the, which is what we were trying to say with uh, with the AI. It's uh, back to front, you know. So every everybody wants this uh, theory of everything and this simple equation that, you know. But it's again, it was like Douglas Adams pointed out. It's like you you know, the, if you got a theory of everything, you'd have like, you know, an identity or something like E equals, you know, like Euler's identity. E to the pi i minus one equals zero and it's like fantastic brilliant you unified all these things now what the fuck does it mean i'll tell you what it means it means the answer to the life the universe and everything is 42. Two, yeah. it's like yeah. uh right what i do with that exactly <laughs> doesn't help you if you had a theory of everything you say now we've conquered the universe you just like five simples uh, symbols describe everything you say oh, why why do they we don't know. <laughs> there's, there's they've uh, that, essentially done it with the fundamental constant. I'll give some more background on, on what he's saying about how physicists are, are somehow lying. As you get into higher level um, mathematics, like uh, differential equations and stuff, um, most of the most of the physics uh, formulas are differential equations, like um, like f equals ma is a differential equation. Force equals mass times acceleration. And um, acceleration is a second derivative of precision. So it's like a, a differential um, thing. So uh, if you um, work backwards to try to predict where things are going to go from that equation, you have to integrate twice and all these things. And there's all these, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a family of solutions that you get. and the the problem is that for equations like that we can have a solution but for um for complex systems or like e even for that if you have three different things in space you've now gotten a chaotic behavior and you can't predict it um in and most of our uh the vast 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 majority of differential equations are unsolvable analytically we we can only simulate them we can't actually uh, know what they would they would be, and um, so we run into basically all we have to do is rely on simulation, and simulation is is a uh, you know we we don't gain any insight from it. We just run, watch it as a movie and see where it goes, but we don't know why anything happened, right? Yeah, and that's why we're in this usability. Because the, in in all the sciences, and particularly the soft ones, the crap ones, uh, they they in this crisis of reproduction, it's, it's even the, in pharma, pharmacological. Even these guys who coming out with you know the, the uh, is ninety three percent effective and stuff like that is is they all doing this. They are all looking too closely at the elephant, and then you you can they're looking at statistical clumping and stuff like that and claiming that it's statistically significant when they're all just doing p-hacking. There's so, there's so much pressure on, on you know, the publish and perish uh, paradigm and all these guys, there's so much pressure to just produce crap. 
that, that uh, over 50%, there's a great paper from 2005, that over 50% of papers published are crap, absolute crap. Yeah. And, you know, 70% are unreproducible. But, you know, but they're saying we, we're heading for Ray Kurzweil singularity because there are more and more than you know papers are published every day there's more and more random bullshit published by undergraduates every day and more and more money going into nothing but it, the results are trickling off into nothing and um so there's a this hidden crisis that no one will talk about because all the all the liberals are screaming listen to the science listen to the experts and all the experts are going fuck this is unraveling on us we better not, not let the public know just keep on putting out these fabulous things Scientists discover that you can live longer by having a pet. Well, just keep keep going with that shit. We keep bamboozling them. Just for God's sake, don't let them know that the Large Hadron Collider is a load of shit where actually nothing is reproduced and they won't allow any of the data out because otherwise somebody will, will call you know call bullshit shit on them. But yeah, there, there's this massive crisis in science. All the scientists know it. They're all sitting in this tiny little silo, going, "This is all bullshit, isn't it?" And they dare not even talk about it because <laughs> because they've just got to the point where progressives and liberals and you know school kids are told that science is wonderful and is going to solve all our problems and they, they you know the behind the scenes it's all crumbling on them and they dare not say anything because it's like politically so damned explosive they like just talk in whispers behind the scenes like why is everything going to crap on us and, and what they all petrified of they lose their funding. <laughs> they, they, it's all yeah. become, you know, it's like this parliament of whores where they're all just trying to get funding, bamboozling the science of it. So, so a large part of all the space exploration and all this stuff going on is is a complete lie. NASA's been selling this lie for decades of like, we have a future in space. It's like, I'll tell you, absolutely, we do not have a future in space. But they, they're never going to tell you that because the one, you know, the high priesthood wants their funding. So they keep on bamboozling the public about this completely batshit crazy world, which we're not going to. Um, and in the meantime, the world where we are going is fucking getting worse and worse. We're heading off into the twilight zone. Um, and, and they won't share that with the public because basically the high priests don't want you to know that God's just been proven to be dead. <laughs> before we, before we get Our idol has gone to on the p-hacking, I really have to say something about that. So um, p-hacking is about uh, essentially, uh, it's a thing in statistics. And what is the root word of statistics? It's the state, it's mathematics of the state. And the, um, the problem is that we've imposed upon all the papers that need to be published that uh, essentially um, p, the p-value only makes sense in like a, in in a Gaussian distribution in a normal curve in a bell curve, right? Um, but, but just tell people what p hacking is first. Just tell people okay. what p hacking. Okay. Okay. So um, uh, normally uh, p is like um, it's a measure of like the confidence interval you have on uh, whether whether the um, the thing that you're you're testing has a greater chance of um, being the thing that that is the the cause behind the the system versus it being random, like uh, so it's it's essentially you you compare yeah. to it's it, kind it's of a little... derivative of a derivative in a way, yeah, yeah, it's um, kind of derivative of a derivative in a way, isn't it? Uh, I I mean I don't know where I would take in, this, in, this, in the sense that. Um, you, you're trying to get another measurement that can give you a confidence level of a previous measurement. So it's kind of like uh, yeah. you're trying to get a truth machine to tell you the difference between randomness and causality. Right? Yeah, that's that's true. Um, but the the essentially you're trying to, they they just arbitrarily pick a random uh, like standard that this is this is what's good and that's like five percent like. Like six sigma, yeah, five, yeah, yeah, five sigma, or that. yeah, and um, so that would give like a confidence interval of ninety five percent or something, right? But um, the the um, the problem with it is that you can you can manipulate that based on your statistics statistics to be able to get publishable, or you can move it around. You can you, essentially this kind of thing. So, um, yeah, the, so, I mean, it's it's it, um. 
Oh, so so Masam Talib uh, says has got a real in the nuts for for this, and it's it's um uh, he says like if you asked a statistician, um you know if you have a a, a coin flip right, and you you have a coin, you go down to a corner in New York, New York, you talk to a hustler, and you talk to a physicist, and you say, and keep on flipping this uh, this coin, and you'd say like okay, you've got heads fifty times in a row, okay, ask the physicist. What's it likely to be on the fifty-first throw? First, 50, the the physicist will say, "Oh well, you know, it'll re regression to the mean. It'll be must be tails after such a long run of heads." That's you know, uh, and but you ask the hustler, you'd say like, "Nah, it's going to be heads. That's a fake coin." Mm -hmm. And the hustler would always be right, <laughs> but that, that's what they're doing. They're saying like, "How how how are heads ten times in a row?" Very, very unlikely. Therefore, I must have just proven that if you get a pet, it's good for your health. <laughs> yeah. So, um, if you get enough uh, monkeys typing on enough of these typewriters, you get uh, some monkey will come out with like ten heads in a row. But it's like six significance. Uh, you know, we all saved. It's like no, that's just monkeys on typewriters. <laughs> yeah, the, the thing that bothers me about on, it go on, sorry. Is, is that um, this this. Uh, mathematical uh, trick is um, is applied universally even if it's not the best model to fit the data so uh, if if you can like do a different technique that would model the the data more accurately than like a Gaussian distribution then you can't get published because you have to be peer reviewable by the other people and so essentially, there are many different kinds of distributions that the that the data could fall under, and uh, but you still have to like kind of force it into this this um, this Gaussian distribution to be be able to be published and be able to be um, peer reviewed because the like if you tried to in introduce like a random forest technique or something to model your data, um, that would meet the data better uh, than it. It, depending on the journal, like the the reviewers wouldn't know what you did, right? So they they just you just have to go and and use the language of everybody to to um, you know use the secret handshake to be able to get your career going. But also they hide all the you know uh, the baseline so that. Yeah, they don't publish negative results. Everything is published based on sensation. So if you come up with some sensational result, then you know people run forward and say, I've just found this gem, um, which no one can reproduce because basically it's a snowflake. But they, um, everybody has to produce a gem. You can't come out with something saying, oh, I tried this experiment, didn't work. It's like, no one will publish that. So nobody has a metric to say, okay, so you found this gem on this beach and so, like you say, okay, now I've just found that this, you know, beach full of gems. Say, no, you found one gem on a beach, and we just haven't got all the other guys who found sand. <laughs> it's like all, all the guys who find sand on there are like they, they get published. And the one guy that comes out with a snowflake gets published. And then everybody runs to the, you know, gold rush starts mining where the guy got the snowflake and come up with nothing. And then they're like, oh no, but like new gold rush on the, over here and run like little kids over to you know the new field with a promising yeah. career. So it's complete bullshit. But anyway, we're supposed to believe that, you know, trust the experts. And it's like, I don't trust the experts. I think they're children. Yeah, that's why I'm, we haven't had many um, breakthroughs in physics after like 1950s or something. Like there, there hasn't been anything new really. Um, well, no new drugs, nothing. nothing. Well, the, same yeah, applies to medicine. the same applies to medicine. That's what Ivan Ilich was saying too. Since the 50s, um, they think it was 50s or 60s, they think there's great progress. There's only techniques. There's only new pharmaceutical molecules developed, but there's no, absolutely no progress in medicine. <laughs> absolutely none. And, and not without and trying. Lots and of money is so, important. So yeah, the the return on in, investment in R and D goes down and down every day. And Ray Kurzweil and and those guys never mentioned that. That that the nobody's doing any R and D. Most of the things that are claimed as R and D isn't R and D. It's just software. 
So software is traditionally put under the R&D bracket. And they all say, there's masses of research and development going on in China. And I'm, no, there isn't. The guys are writing fucking Pokemon apps. <laughs> That's not R&D. And so the... But it gets chalked up in the GDP as masses of research. So, but this is terribly, terribly important because the economists are relying on tech as a magic, uh, as a you know magic hat where the rabbit's going to be pulled out that saves uh, this industrial society. So they say, you know, tons of CO two going up, but it doesn't matter. You know, at the rate of technological progress. Uh, we will have sorted out how to pull it all down out of the atmosphere later. It's a problem for tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how does so that work for cancer? It's based on the declining technology. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, it, you get you you really get shut down fast if you're a dinosaur like me and say, "Hey, when I was a kid, this is what technology was supposed to." Do. Like flying cars, cure for cancer. We're all going to eat pills that you know solve food problems all the you know what problems all of this shit we're all gonna have space colonies with we're, we're gonna have a two-day work week what happened to all of that you fucking frauds but you're not allowed to say that you got to say look, look, we, look, look at the iphone and they say well fucking uh, we were supposed to have dick tracy watches uh, you know decades before the iphone it's like come on guys this is a huge fraud who put up that, that um... futurist magazine it's, like, it's ridiculous you put up a video here uh, touched on that business of the, the, the non-realization of the Jetson dream. I, I can't think what it, who it was now. Do you remember what that was? Um, yeah. I, yeah. You know, yeah, there's yeah, obviously yeah. a. Uh, um, you know, we're, we're we're at the kind of point of, um, uh, you know, the utility value of. Uh, I mean, you know, the diminishing returns that you're just saying. You see, this is massive what effort is revealing about. nothing. Yeah, but this is nobody's talking about this. That that no one's putting money into R and D because everybody knows that science experiments don't return anything. I found this over my career is that they were in, in decades past, people were were more willing to actually invest in what they what investors derogatively call science projects. A science project means something you don't want to invest in because it's too risky and it takes too long to to develop. So, but if 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 you approach uh, if you do a pitch to investors and they say ah it's a science project it's their way of saying like it's cold fusion or oh, it's like uh, quantum computing it's never going to return any money this, yeah. this in five lifetimes. But you see nobody's saying that nobody's saying that all these investors. They know that the science doesn't return any money. So it's all being done with government money because the, the public is still duped. The public is still, you know, in the 1950s thinking science, the next frontier. And so they can still get money out of the public. The do, private do you... money is not going into these things because the guys get burnt and they know bloody well that don't touch this thing. There's no scientific progress. There's no, there's no progress in medicine. And it's all overhyped bullshit. But, you know, it's like... If you actually look at these robots and stuff like Elon Musk, too, we're going to have a general purpose robot that's going to be, you know, the Betty the housemaid or something from the Jetsons. He's lying. If, if you look at General Dynamics on the hardware, just the hardware, there are no advances in software. It's basically, I in the 1980s, I could have done a, a robot exactly like they're doing in General Dynamics today. The only difference is they've got slightly denser batteries. So basically, neodymium magnets were the big difference. Apart from that, we, we are in the 1950s. Robbie the robot is, you know, could have been done in the same way today by General Dynamics. And everybody's getting all breathy about, oh, look, uh, look at the animatronics. Are you I talking about animatronics in the fucking 80s? Talking about Boston Dynamics? Oh, yeah, Boston Dynamics, yeah. General Dynamics is the uh, defense contractor. Can yeah, I, uh, Dynamics, yeah. but I just, can I ask you something, just insert it's something all in there, illusion. which I think came up in that video. I can't remember the name of it. There's two points. One is uh, that isn't a lot of research and development now is very much um, won't be funded anyway unless it's kind of very goal-oriented. Um, 
and so it's it's kind of narrowed down to trying to achieve certain ends. Whereas, uh, you know, as you're saying a minute ago about no significant breakthroughs having been made since the middle of last century, and that, um, but you're getting back then into a time when there was more um, basically tinkering around. You know, the people who were who were developing new things were, were that was coming out of a, a ferment where where they they would could do, follow their their interest. Um, and they weren't actually being told what to do yeah. to the degree that they are now. Um, and that also came out, I think it was in that same video, where they referred to, um, I think, a condition in England, you know, going back uh, pro probably, you know, uh, uh, more than 100 years ago, where, you know, there were sort of well-educated people who had gone into the clergy, um, then sent off into various places in the countryside, and they had a, a bit of money and plenty of time and, 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 you know, they were being looked after. And this is where they started using their intellects to come up with rather remarkable discoveries and things because they were just being left to go on a great exploration of their own. They weren't being directed or trammeled in any way by somebody else's requirements. Um, but we're at the opposite end of that kind of spectrum now where, where everything's got to be uh, you know, within a certain discipline and for a certain reason and all this kind of thing. We, we've left behind the 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 the, uh, the genuinely um, free exploratory uh, kind of thing. Um, you know, and yeah, I think that's another fact that, that it's have happened. Yeah, there, there are two things that have happened. One, one of them is that there's no more low-hanging low fruit. So you can't have old individual scientists at the point in, in giving people tenure, and they don't. Nobody gets tenure to go and you know do their fantasy research because there's only big science left now. Every you know papers have more and more um, uh, contributors on them now. They're in the thousands. Any any groundbreaking scientific paper will have in the thousands now of contributors, and so uh, there's that and. This happens from Reagan and from Thatcher. Thatcher was a scientist, and she she did her pals in, she did her colleagues in by saying that from here on out, uh, there has to be some uh, application. And basically, science has to be utilitarian, and unless it's commercializable and um, patentable and has some uh, economic application, it's we're not funding it. We're not funding blue sky research anymore. And uh, that, that did science in, because now if you do a research grant uh, proposal, you have to know results before you, you, you start. You, you know, they have to be accessible, they have to be provable. Um, otherwise, a reviewer will shoot it down and say, like, well, you, you know, nobody knows how to do N. You say, yeah, well, that's what we're doing. And this proposal is trying to figure out how to do N and say, well, unless you can tell me exactly in detail how N is going to be done, we're not funding this. And so, <clears throat> so nothing that's innovative can get funded. Everything has to be a minor increment unknown. So, so it only moves forward almost by accidents of what you can get past in, in proposal. And, and then now <coughs> all the – there was a day when like, – like National Semiconductor and Intel, they did actual fundamental research. It's all done by the government now. They all do it with SIBIRs and stuff, small business investment research grants. And uh, and so it's uh, it's all has a military aspect to it because the, the government's only interested in one thing, and that's basically saving its ass. And so everything starts to look a little bit dark. It all starts to look a little bit like general dynamics. And Boston Dynamics, <laughs> and it's it's all hypersonic missiles, and it's all like, guys, uh, what about cancer? Well, you know that doesn't help the U.S. military. Well, hypersonic missiles so, that yeah, would be general dynamics. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but it, it, you know they all everything's a little bit dark. If you look at medicine. It's all it looks like saying, guys, that's bioweapons research, isn't it? No, 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 no. It's for people with Parkinson's disease. It's like, name five people with Parkinson's disease, arsehole. It's like, no, I don't know anybody with Parkinson's disease, but I've devoted my life to this. Like, oh, lies. 
You're doing far with it, you monkey. Can I? Uh, can we change the subject? Are, are we? Are you? What do you want to do? Is it getting a bit we, late? We, we should be off. I think we've we gone on quite long, but but yeah, we right, have sure. yeah. launch. I, I want to go back to the. We can do it next time. You might be able to continue it in the next next one if I just started off, um, which is to do with the the kind of mechanics or the dynamics of the flippening, um, and uh, I was still trying to visualise this adequately in my feverish imagination, and um, uh, when the Earth flips. Does the axis of rotation stay the same relative to the orbital plane? Uh, that was the first question. Uh, and yeah, okay, we'll just stick with that because that's why I've got my apple here. So, yeah, that, that's, yeah. You've got, supposing you've got the sun there somewhere, just there, supposing, and the Earth is tilted at whatever it is, 22 and a half degrees, and it goes around it. The axis is always relative to some fixed point out in space. That axis it always has the same inclination, okay, it, 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 as it goes around the sun. So you can go, you've got summer here and winter there, and then when it goes around the other side of, uh, uh, sorry, when it goes around the other side of the sun, you've got the summer there and the winter here, kind of thing. Okay, when this flipping occurs. Um, it seems to me as though the the axis of rotation will not change its angle in relation to the orbital plane. In other words, the if you, supposing the orbital plane is just horizontal here for the moment, and that's our, our 22 and a half yeah. degrees, that will remain the same, but the apple is going to turn 23. to some... The apple is going to turn... But the axis will stay there. If you look at that video for the oh, yeah. for the wing nut, you know the wing nut was coming out like that. It showed it doing a complete flip, but it yeah. also showed that this axis never moved in relation to the say a fixed point in the inside the spacecraft. Uh, I'm assuming that's the same yeah. thing. Okay, now yeah. what I want to do is just okay, challenge. So... Go on. You want to say something? Because I'll, I'll I'll go on a little bit further. Go on. Oh no! Finish off. Finish off. Okay. Now. So what I was just then. Because you've got a situation where well, I'll come back to that rather confusing. I'll just keep going. So we're here. Uh, this flipping occurs. Uh, so supposingly, supposing that the, the 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 polar points will be somewhere in in a secret location in the Mediterranean, on the one side of the planet, and on the other side of the planet, it'll come out somewhere near, near New Zealand. So we're moving from from uh, the current North Pole and rotating maybe about 35 or 40 degrees or something like that. So the apple is going to move on the stick by about 35 degrees or something. It's going to be your new rotational axis. Now, as you were saying, the safest place to be is at the point of rotation because it's going to be calm, bigger, less stress on the crust, less tidal act, um, uh, or, or all sorts of disturbances are going to be less at the new polar location. So to put it like this, you're going to be very safe there when that happens, but then you're going to have to leave very soon afterwards because aren't you now going to be at the North Pole and it's going to start getting very cold fairly soon? So you're going to be at the safest physical point but then it's going to start to freeze over. C can you see once the flipping has occurred and everything yes. settled down, yes. that is no longer the best place to, to be? D yeah. Does that make so sense? This is why I keep on coming back to a boat. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, okay, so there's lots to say on this, and maybe we should address it in the in the next one. In but the I'll, I'll next say one, straight yeah. up is that, that my, my thinking it, and everything I know is that the, the geographic pole reversal is a 180 degree flip. And so it, it really inverts and comes back to exactly the same spot. Um, and it still keeps the, you know, 32, 23.4 degree tilt. And so the, the reason I say that is because if you look at the um, 
at the inertial model, the, the basically the the third axis or the flip axis is is just imagine tiny flywheel weights. The the vast majority of the momentum is equatorial. It's going round and round in on the equator as it is now. So you can't really describe. You would need a tremendous force to displace uh, that. Uh, and inertial mass that's rotating around the, equator the equatorial inertial mass. So my assumption is that it flips ex exactly symmetrically. Now, there's a couple of things to say about this. One of them is when you see the wing nights in that, th those are very symmetrical objects. The, the third axis is, is a tiny, tiny discrepancy on the major uh, inertial mass uh, that's rotating. So so uh, you, you're just talking about a little flutter, a little flywheel um, that's going to move the, the big the big thing. Now, the Earth isn't symmetrical. It's like a knobbly to potato. The, the Greenland and stuff is a massive inertial mass. And the, the gravity of, of Earth is all wobbly. It's all, you know, uh, so uh, to me, it's kind of remarkable that it is spinning without more precession. It should be like, you know, really kind of chaotic. So it's remarkable that it is, it does uh, lies like that. Now, here's the, the kicker. It's not a rigid object, right? So it's got fluid. Uh, the mantle is all fluid. Now, if you have a look at uh, fluid in a container, which is, okay, let's imagine the crust is kind of like a some very, very thin container, and then it's it's basically a big you know, bubble of fluid. If you have a look at like Pettit, uh, Pettit in the, was an astronaut in um, the International uh, Space Station, and he showed the Dunning-Beckhoff effect with the liquid bottle. And then you can clearly see, you know, how if you'd spin a bottle full of liquid, which is like kind of a good model for the Earth. Um, it, it basically it, it quickly uh, rotates and forms a new orientation and then stabilizes very stably in that position. The thing is, though, it's not generally a one eighty degree flip. So the uh, the other thing, although it stabilizes itself and, and eventually stabilizes without much precession or wobble, um, it's uh, it's not a one eighty degree um, a flip and the, the evidence for for this is okay so you must imagine they often have this kind of a t that they show as the object that they're rotating it's often a, it's a good metaphor for a three-axis body but it, you know the earth isn't a symmetrical t like that it's kind of more like a y or something like that dynamics of the flip need, needs to be challenged certainly my ideas about the dynamics of the flip I think everybody should go and do, do their own research and challenge them. But there's also evidence that the North Pole and stuff, if you look at the Antarctic, they have all these fossils. They're crocodiles living in the Arctic and the Antarctic and stuff like that. It's clearly it goes tropical. Now, it's, it can't be the Earth going into a hot house state. I think it's basically they're misreading the fact that the poles have actually migrated. And then there must be an ice age pole somewhere while all these crocodiles are in the Antarctic and stuff. So it, it looks like from the fossil record that uh, the poles migrate around. So Hapgood and that thought that the the flip was just small, you know, 20 degrees or something like that. And a lot, a lot of guys thought it was gradual and just went clip, clip, clip like that. It's certainly not quite like that. But it's um, where the pole star is at the end of this flip might not be at the southern southern hemisphere. Um, and so, yeah, it definitely needs to be challenged. But this is why I say, you know, I always come back to the boat thing, and I hope I'm not reinforcing everybody down this path because we need a like diversity of opinion on this. But I, I think that, um, uh, yeah, uh, it's there's enough uncertainty that you want to be able to move. So I, I've always thought that you want to find the tropics again after, everything stabilized there's also the bit of a gotcha is that that when the poles uh migrate um you know there's probably more ice loss so so in other words with the initial flip or initial mass uh, displacement the antarctic for example doesn't play a big part in it because it's symmetrical about the axis so a big melt in the arctic ice doesn't really change 
the initial mass of the spinning Earth. But that won't be true if it's not a symmetrical flip. If if the Antarctic winds up, say, at about 40 degrees latitude after the flip, then it'll be in the quicks. And then you've got a massive another melt and uh, another flip, potentially. Yeah, you could get so into a kind of think that... series, a sequence of them, where they just keep one, one after the other. I think, well, I, I think that's what the ice cores show. So you can see in the Pleistocene, the, there's this very regular, um, which uh, in, implies that it's a, a, a symmetrical inversion. But then the uh, the other periods where the, you see this little flurry and this little chaos, mm -hmm. the, it's possible that the, the older and younger trias were the bookends of two flips. So you get, you know, a partial melt of the Laurentide ice sheet, you get Lake Agassiz, and then you get more displacement. And then, uh, you know, you'll have another flip. They seem to go in pairs or maybe little flurries. And so, so you might have to, you know, within 100 years or maybe even less, uh, 10 years maybe, you might have to negotiate another flip. But either way, I always come back to the same thing, is you've got to be mobile. And, and you, you won't be able to trek across continents, right? So if you if you say, oh, well, I'll... I'll hunker down in Fort Cheney, like I think some some of the guys want to do. It's like that's not very cool because what what are you going to do when you to you you might have to get to you might find oh well fuck it man I'm now in the middle of the North Pole, you know, you'll have to like trek across the North Pole in terrible conditions while all this you know precipitation and ice is falling on you. Um, there's very it'll be hard to live off the land and and you've got to migrate south. Um, and what happens when you hit the ocean? <laughs> you might think, damn, uh, we're going to die on the shoreline. But, uh, you know, so I always come back to you've got to be mobile. You're back, so back to a kind of Noah's, and so, You're back yeah. to a kind of Noah's Ark um, <laughs> theme. Like, you yeah, know, comes, having something well, to float at the same time as, you know, because it's like that's what comes to mind, you know. I think... Individual boats but, but, might but not this be is again and again, you come back to the old stuff. Yeah, but, but I don't think individual boats are, are, are uh, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I know you are, you are like that, but is, is uh, again, like you talk about, you talk about mutual aid, you talk about leaving other people. I think uh, bigger ships and several people on ships would be a better option. And, uh, you know, having that option as a, as a land community, to have also this this possibility to to, to board a, a a ship that would house uh, people, animals, whatever you know, would be a better scenario in what we're talking about. You you'll be a rat, Sophie. I was hoping yes. to look um, that that you're. Um, I think you are about as far from Hugh as you are from the North Pole. So when Hugh becomes the North Pole, you'll still be just as far away from the North Pole. So you'll probably be okay. <laughs> there, there was I mean, only. I'm, I'm, I'm not planning to be the North Pole. I'm planning to be the. No, you'll have to leave the North Pole so after the flip back. Yeah, then. yeah. What I was. Well, um, well, then hopefully the North Pole will be in Antarctica, and it's if then it doesn't complete. Have, have far to go. The other, we better exactly. wind this up. Um, I'll just leave you with the final question, and then we'll we'll probably better finish the meeting. But um, what I was. Uh, kind of pondering is that what is so sacred about this angle that it always seems to be preserved i mean you know the earth could do that and we could have perpetual sunlight here uh for six months of the year you know and then on a you know or it could do that and we could have um uh no seasons for, for instance but the, the the, the 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 axis position of the axis um, relative to the to the orbital plane, um, it, it appears that that's preserved that that won't change, but I don't know if that's a wrong assumption. Like like well, you know somehow or another the Earth ended up in that position, um, and you know we're assuming that the Earth moves on the axis, not that the axis moves and the Earth comes with it. Uh, which is a bit of a thorny thing because the axis is kind of defined by the Earth's rotation. But 
uh, I just wasn't quite sure. I couldn't kind of. Um, I couldn't quite. Have... Uh, yeah. So so I'm I the I'm not sure that the inclination will be the same the evidence from other planets like uh which one are they couple that are in uranus. uranus and then nobody has which one uranus it's that, that inverted uranus. did it venus 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 or oh. uranus i said uranus is the one that's like off off the the uh the orbital plane so that's kind of yeah so, so yes so, so Uranus is probably, yeah. So Uranus is probably fli uh, flipped, right? But, but there's well, one actually, planet. I think, that's, I think uh, the orbit the, is outside of the plane of the rest of the planets, but it's I don't know about its spin axis. Uh, so, so one of the planets is Venus or something is rotating backwards, which seems to indicate that it flipped. It. Uh, but. Uh, What's the other planets don't it doesn't all go well from the other planets but based on uh, that the inclination will stay the same, but it's it's well uh, worth researching. Uh, I haven't done any research into uh, have the seasons changed in the Uranus, go Uranus, back in deep is, on time. A, Uranus is on a 98 degrees um, axis rotation, so it's it's literally turning on its side, like you know, <laughs> like that. Yeah. That, yeah. So that it gets like six months of three months of daylight. It comes around. It's facing that way. Gets its spring, winter, autumn. You know, you, you get a day. Your day is three months or, or whatever you like, six months long. You get you're getting the same effect as we now get at the north and south pole. Although no, you're going. But then when you're in your oh. your, your equinoxes, you you're rotating that way. So you, you're still getting a 24-hour rotation, but it's not bringing you a day and night anymore. Um, so um, it, yeah, but well, what's what's the planet that goes the wrong? It uh, revolves the wrong way. Yeah, I know what you mean. I don't know which one it is. I don't know if it's Venus or not. I can't yeah. remember which one it is. I think no. it's one of the inner planets. It probably is. Thing. Yeah. Um, anyway, look, look. If you well, want to yeah. just. Uh, Yes, leave those questions planet. for the. Sorry, Ron. It's, you want to? It's Venus. Our our neighboring planet Venus is an oddball in many ways. For starters, it spins in the opposite directions from most most other yeah. planets, including Earth. Uh, yeah. So that on Venus, the yeah, sun rises Venus. to the west. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sun rises. To the yeah. West so Venus. so we 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 will. Yeah. So after the flip, we'll be something like Venus, and 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 funnily enough. Uh, Venus is probably very good to study from this point of view because it it had an atmosphere and probably ice yeah, caps. Yeah. And now it's um, greenhouse gas. It's it it went through exactly what we're going through, and so I think it's worth studying. But the only two ways that uh, a planet could do that kind of a uh, have that kind of anomaly, and that's if it was collision or uh, sign a back off type of flip. Mm. So it. The collision thing never looks good. Whenever you look at the collision, it, it, seem, it seems to me that you get asteroid belt more than you get, you know, the things coagulating. Um, there are very good reasons why things don't coagulate very well afterwards. If you look at like Maxwell's study of the rings of Saturn, the the rings of Saturn are very interesting and they move at different speeds. So it's very hard to see how they they all you know get back together again in a nice spinning lump. Um, so yeah, I I have grave doubts about uh, collisions being responsible for those those kind of things, and I think the crustal phenomena and stuff that don't don't make uh, the collisions look very very good. So maybe the moon was created by a collision, but you you know like look at the moon, the moon never came back down to Earth and made a merged again. So it's um, it has you know the fact that it sh shows one face towards the earth is a strong indication that they, might, they probably were the same body that split so i'll grant you that the moon is um was created by a, a dramatic collision but like a, you know to get to get a, a thing completely reversed in its geographical rotation is um i, th I think that's a bit close to the velenoski and you know the 
planets in collision it's like complete pseudoscience so i don't i don't give any credence to, to wouldn't collisions it be, causing wouldn't that. it be really a, a fun thing to have a to interview or if anybody of us know a, an astrophysicist who might just come into our game and and decide to to talk to us about this it would wouldn't it be just fantastic to It'd have an excellent thing. <laughs> excellent mm. you bet you see they're gonna they're gonna shoot it down for i mean you've got to be prepared for them to shoot it down as there's the invented here syndrome uh so they they uh why venus spins the wrong way ah oh, there you go oh uh, my god yeah this is this but, is saying so, the current theory holds that venus initially spun in the same direction as most other planets and in a way it still does it's simply flipped to 180 degrees at some point in other words in the same direction always has just upside down looking at it from a planet makes the spin team black back uh, well there you go that's the mantle and core could have caused the flip in the first place so that's what the scientific says uh, science that's on venus but I th yeah i th i think it's also worth looking at the uh the the ice uh, the terrestrial ice on Venus as well, and so, because uh, the, the it had uh, there was water vapor um, on Venus, and uh, it had a nice greenhouse um, atmosphere, and all the water vapor has been boiled off, so it probably had oceans, and I presume it probably had ice caps too. So, so uh, if you ask why did it suddenly flip, I think it's exactly the same scenario as now. What, what I'm proposing in this. Um, thing that i'm writing up slowly the manifesto for the extinctionality is that uh, you know i'm proposing just to call it the the fr the freeze thaw cycle um and basically that's thaw with uh, T H O R. you get the joke um but the uh because it's a violent uh, violence at the end of the thaw um but i i think it's possible that uh, venus shows shows pretty much what what happens we, we are going on venus trajectory very very scary because uh, Venus is a, a hot house Earth uh, scenario, and then v v Venus is, has had catastrophic warming that sterilized the planet. So we Earth could be on that trajectory. Yeah, Thor's hammer exactly. Yep. Do, exactly. do you want do you want to uh, um, develop some of those uh, things just on the next meeting, and oh, maybe that's enough oh, for this one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but but I like Sophie's idea about talking to mm. people. Um, as long as we understand that they absolutely, you know, this is a, you know, kind of, if you if you want to know the treatment you're going to get is is go and have a look at the Earth, uh, the continental drift guy. I can't remember what his name is now, but the, the guy that came up with continental drift. My God, did they pillory? I, you know, continental drift is is one of the icons of geolo geology and geography now but um when the guy came up with it um he was absolutely pilloried my god were they cruel i mean david ike has nothing compared to what they did to him with his um with his earth crust uh well i mean his uh continental drift and then uh, you know, it's a gra you know they they were visceral, visceral because what it was saying to them is you you know nothing idiots who've been to college and listened to a whole lot of professors who were talking out of their ass. Yeah, and but so because, it's because, like you, you you're absolutely yeah. attacking the high priesthood, and they will tear you apart. The, yeah, but because Ryan Ryan explained and 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 posted this thing on Venus, and the the, the word flip is mentioned in that. Wouldn't it be interesting to learn? To lure a, 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 a nice astrophysicist to to make a parallel, a, an eventual parallel with what happened on start, start with Venus case, explain it to us, and then we could we could slowly move into an Earth scenario, and then we could get hammered, all right. But it would just be interesting to to, to have the physics, so, you know. Yeah, no. So astrophysicists will be kinder. Um, because they they don't have anything at stake. It's uh, the geologists and, and geographers. The, those guys have. Uh, it's the earth sciences guys that that you're really impinging on their territory, and they're incredibly conservative. 
uh, you know, they, they also know a little bit about Habgood. So they, they probably know about uh, Velenovsky and Habgood. And, and the, the reason they know it is they, uh, Velenovsky in particular is used as a prime example of pseudoscience. So when they introduced uh, college graduates uh, or undergraduates to the, the idea of pseudoscience, they use Velenovsky as an example of pseudoscience. And so the very thing that we're talking about now is, uh, is, is they associated in their mind with Judaism. So they're coming in straight away. If they talk to the extinctionati, they're coming in straight away that they're talking to a flat earther. So they'll be patronizing. They, they're not going to entertain it. They, they'll be just, how can I explain to these stupid, benighted idiots that, that they're full of crap? And that, that's that's what they'll they come. But where I think it would be interesting is, is uh, you you'll, uh, they'll surface all these, you know, bullshit arguments. Like one of them I know straight up is like, they say, rebound. So one of the things they say is, no, the earth does not fl flip because the mass displacement because of rebound. When the Greenland ice sheet melts, according to them, you know, the mantle is being depressed and all the ice melts, it rebounds, and then the mass is exactly equal. It's like yeah, but rubbish. My, my, point, my point would be to start on Venus. And then, and then go to 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 you know, then gradually yeah. go to our situation. But does anybody know an astrophysicist that you follow or that you're interested? Because I I really like astrophysics, but I honestly looked at most videos on most mainstream American guys. It would be impossible to get. But there might be some local. Uh, I look into I'm, my. I'm friends with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Oh. I'm, I'm friends with Neil deGrasse Tyson. If you want to speak really, to him. wow. Well, listen, I mean, no. that is some celebrity no. <laughs> because I don't know what he, uh, why don't you try? No, I, I channel, I channel Carl Sagan. I, I channel Carl Sagan. It helps. But uh, know, I, that's a freaking excellent idea, especially starting with Venus and, and tiptoeing towards it. But do you yeah. actually need an astrophysicist? You simply need somebody who understands uh, how this works. And can just tell us if we're making some fundamental error of, of reasoning and looking at this. You know, they don't what? necessarily need to be somebody who's deeply invested in in a scientific career. Yeah, but as just, they just are, 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 are fun. You know, they have a they have a broad kind of you know they're they're so in in the universe in space that talking mm. about a little flip of a planet for them could be fun. Um, if, mm. if, we, if we talk about somebody who's too grounded on Earth. It's it's going to be it's going to turn into what uh, Hugh is saying, you know, just dismissal. Yeah, well, just... Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, how are we going to approach this? I, I think we should go and look at videos and stuff and, and try and find the the biggest celeb we can that would talk to us. We can find a Venus specialist. Uh, and uh, a guy who's who I know. I you know who you know who I would like. Is um, uh, Hossenfeld blood oblivion? Sabine Hoffman's oh. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. She yeah. must be running out of things to talk about. She would talk to us, surely. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's not a big enough name to diss us, is she? Would you try would, to approach her? Would you do her? it, Sophie? Would you, would you try to get hold of her? I think you would be better. Try and approach her. And... I can't, I don't know. Um, I could try. Uh, I uh, on, but we, uh, what would be the? I, I will send you an email and we'll see about that. We 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 talk, we'll, we talk, we'll we talk about uh, we want to talk about why Venus flipped. Yeah. But we, let, just say we want to talk about why Venus flipped and could Earth flip in the same way. So there there are two different hypotheses for Venus. One is where it flipped, and the other is where it slowly spun down to zero and then started spinning the other way. Mm. Well, which makes no sense. Otherwise, it would still be processing. Who's that? Is that Sabine? I mean, what applies the breaking is, force? That that Sabine German name is she? Um, is she a physicist? Is she a geographer? Is she a scientist? She's a physicist. physicist. She's a physicist. Okay. Physicists are better because physicists um, they 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 happily stomp all over 
geographers stuff and you know mm. the geographers always say like uh, look at the ice core and you know the the geographers they always go back to the fucking ice core because that was the the best thing they ever did but they uh, uh dare i said the geographers are a little bit dumb so in other words you say uh, you know they're dogmatic and dumb they're more vogan -ish. And they they're very very stuck in their ways. They're conservative, so they they will tell you some shit that you you just you have to go away. And uh, it's kind of conversation stopper. They'll use conversation stopper. So they'll tell you, oh bloody bloody blah, did an ice core in Antarctica, and there's a no CO two spike then. So shut up. And you like say, they like guys with the methane hypothesis. They said no, the methane clathrate gun is not a thing because we did an ice core in Antarctica and there's a huge CO2 spike, but no methane spike. Well, the methane turns to fucking CO2, you moron. That's the OH turns it. So obviously you get a huge spike in CO2 in the thing exactly like you got. It's, you found the proof of the clathrate gun hypothesis and the headline on your paper is clathrate hypothesis debunked. <laughs> it was like, you just proved it, and then you say you debunked it. But you know, you the way they work, you oh man. Anyway, but it, it'd be good to to engage them, just for the publicity, just for just for the entertainment value. But all right, yeah. So well, Sabine would be good. But if anybody comes across somebody, um, especially a physicist, that will that is is. Marginally uh, celeb, that would be really cool. Because if if you talk to any anybody that's just roughly known, you could you could like get ten thousand views or something, and that would be really good. But good. All right. Well, we better end there. I think it was kind of a long one. <laughs> um, and then should we just pause and then. Um, Pick it up again in the Western one. So, what, what did you want, Gary, in the Western one is to address? We should address this say, more. I want to. I just want to. Sophie was saying about sailing. And, yeah, and yeah. No, I just wanted to, to say those things about the axis and the, uh, uh, you know, where the pole will end up and then what, you know, just, to, just if you want to expand on that or if you think we just leave mm -hmm. it for the time being, if we're going to talk to somebody else. Yeah, I just wanted to to suggest it. That's all. Um, no, I, I would like to go into that because yeah, yeah the, the actual uh, mechanics of the flip and what where it winds up afterwards, mm. I think, are uh, very important subjects. And I, I, I hopefully people have some opinions. Yeah, I was just I, I was just intrigued because. It, it, for some reason, it appears that the position of the axis of rotation is gets preserved, and it just seemed rather curious to me that it was, a, for some reason, a seemingly a sacred thing that wasn't going to move. Um, you know that the actual surface would move, but the axis of rotation would would stay in the same orientation. But I don't know if that's the case or not. Uh, so you know. Uh, it's it, we need to investigate it because mm. the way I think of it is that you could wind up with a different orientation, but it would have yeah. to be bought at the expense of precession. Uh, so, in other words, if you've got any anomalies in the spin, they would have to be accounted for in the wobble because, mm. in general, the energy all has to be conserved. You can lose a bit of energy through heat and a few of the cataclysmic forces that you know. <clears throat> tidal forces and shit that goes on, uh, volcanic stuff and the, the part of the calamity. You can you can lose some of the energy in heat like that, but I don't think the Earth is, since it started, is is slowing down or slowing down spin. So I think it's conserving all the inertia. So you shouldn't see think of any losses. I don't think that would be minimal. And and then then you have to say, okay, if if there's any uh, say aberration in the in the spin afterwards, then it has to be accounted for some somewhere. So in, so in other words, think of this: if you got it, uh, you know, it did a forty five degree flip and and stabilized at forty five degrees. It's like to stop at forty at forty five degrees. You got to you got to say like what applies the braking force, and then you know now the there's a huge inertial displacement. 
and then you have to say, you know, well, where, where is the energy of that? It looks like the energy has been massively redistributed. The only way I can think of it redistributing is in some other motion like procession. But somebody should fact check me on that one. Yes, you've also got as well, <clears throat> which is what I was thinking, was if the axis does move, you've got uh, a massive ch change in seasonality. You know, like at one extreme, you've got no seasons. Uh, and at the other extreme, you've got uh, seasons which are, are like um, never ending. Um, and and then every gr every gradation in between, depending on, on what axis, of, whether your axis tilts anymore. Um, uh, you know, I was even thinking about things like is is the is the tilt of the Earth that we have now one of those remarkable cosmic uh, coincidences, like the appearance of conscious life on the Earth? No, um, no, no, you know, I don't think so. I don't think so because it, I don't think so because of like if you look at Pettit's um, water bottle that he spins in space, you you can mm. see there that it it stabilizes. Um, How do you spell on, that? On a new new orientation, Pettit P I T T I T. Um, on the ISS, so so I think if you Google like Zanet Backoff Pettit ISS water bottle. He, he spun a few things like eggs and stuff. He's oh, there's a good one. He shows the difference between figuring out in space whether you have a hard-boiled egg or a, um, uh, an unboiled, a fresh egg. Um, oh, I saw because that. The, you see, it's all based on the liquid, the liquid circulating. So, so a hard-boiled egg does something completely different because it's a rigid body, and but Earth is is a liquid body. So you, it, it resembles the, the water bottle. And then you can see what the water bottle does quite plainly. It, it doesn't flip 180 degrees, but its new orientation is very stable. It doesn't process much. So, but it, it is very important about the seasons and whether we lost the season. So now in the, so I understand the temperature record. There were long periods in the, like between the ice ages where the, there wasn't much season. Now, I think that they think that's because the, the whole world is kind of hot and tropical. But I don't think that makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> I, think, um, I think it's that uh, we might have lost the, the seasons and they're looking at a, at a temperate zone or a tropical zone. And the zones don't have no seasonality. So that could account for... You see, if you look, it's very interesting because of the fauna and flora and stuff. And you have to... <clears throat> in all these things, you have to have all these paleo species like crocodiles. They all have to survive. And you think like, if you look at the temperature record, you say, how does a crocodile live through this? It's like for most of it's been the ice age. I mean, crocodiles only live in, in temperate stuff, right? There are no crocodiles in Norway. <clears throat> and so you have to say, look, take one species. Uh, plant species, look at ferns and look at palm trees and say cicada, uh, cic uh, cicadas, not cicadas. Yeah, look at insects would be interesting, but also um, uh, not, not cicadas, cyclicades. What do you call those? Cycads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look at cycads. Mm -hmm. So cycads and stuff like these. So somehow <laughs> they, they squeak through a tropical environment, even though the temperature record says, oh, this is a fucking snowball earth or something, you know, like. So I, if you have a look at the ranges, I don't think those things have changed or evolved the temperature ranges that they can survive. So the fossils of um, things like crocodiles and uh, cycads, things like that, they, they will give you a good idea of what the local temperature was like of there was a fossil there. So so it, it, all these things are like in Antarctica. You can find these things in Antarctica. So um, but it it'd be very interesting to see I mean I don't think uh, crocodiles can survive seasons. They gotta be kind of in um warm all the time in a tropical environment. So, yeah so uh, but all of those things are, are good to figure out whether the tropics, um, the catalyst, yeah, 
catalytic yeah that's it the catalytic pole shift hypothesis is what this is no, normally called cataclysmic cataclysmic, yeah. uh, cataclysmic pole shift yeah so it's it's better i'm writing it all up in in the manifesto but it's really Harvard and Einstein um, they they did most of this when but but Hapgood got stuck on earth crust displacement he just thought the crusts displaced which can't be true because the continents would disappear in the subduction zones if, if that was true if, they, if the earth flip if the if the crust moved violently it's like you know they'd be swallowed up in the subducted zones of past continents so it can't be it can't be right but it, Einstein did the foreword to Hapgood's book and I, eventually Einstein went, although initially he was very keen on the theory, he went, uh, he he cooled off on it because he did lots of sums and he, he said that there isn't a force that could move the crust uh, this much. He didn't know about the Zanderbakov effect and he, did, he was always pretty crap at um, circular motion and inertia that was not einstein's strong point he had a kind of blind spots there but the uh eventually hapgood um hapgood also came to agree with einstein and said yeah there isn't a, a force that can actually do this massive um pole shift um and so it isn't but uh yeah that's that's why it kind of died it was it got revived in 1985 by the soviets uh because they they suddenly realized the force that does it is the Zani Bekov effect. And that's why they classified it, the information for 10 years. But um, my understanding is that the, the US got the, from Endeavour, I think it was Endeavour, what it was, maybe Telstar, whatever the first communication satellite was. The, the Americans found out about the Zani Bekov effect in the, in the 50s with the first satellite, maybe 51 or so. But the, they, uh, they never connected it with the earth flip but Zani back of instantly as soon as he saw the you know the wing nut flip um he started using modeling clay and astrocene and, and modeled the earth flip and so instantly the soviets classified it because they they realized that's that's the force <laughs> that einstein and uh, hapgood couldn't figure out uh, then from from then and after the collapse of the soviet union my understanding is that the 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 u.s then figured it out uh, as well and has been I'm, prepping for it ever since the thing i'm confused about is uh how do you if you just spin something in space and it flips like how do you get such a long periodicity on this on the uh spinning on the main axis because a, a lot of the things that i've seen they they do like uh 10 or so spins and then flip and then 10 or so spins and then flip Right, it's not like uh, you know, however millions of years, <laughs> whatever we, where it's been uh, stable. It, it's it's all about the relative mass, the the relative mass of of uh, the the third axis versus the first uh, spin axis. So, if you have a huge body like the Earth um, and a relatively tiny little flywheel, uh, yeah, it's it's got. What it's doing is accumulating a, an aberration, right? So it's 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 kind of like Lorentz stability, but it's 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 just a little bit off, and then it's like a swing. Each time it goes around, it's accumulating a tiny bit more um, inertia on the the flip axis. So eventually, it's um, it tips. Uh, basically, it goes over a point where it's actually providing a, a big impetus um, to the flip. Flip axis, but uh, my understanding is it accumulates very slowly, and until basically um, it becomes visible and flip, and, and then it, it appears very sudden because you know the actual point where it's just providing a tiny wobble to the point where it actually flips is is uh, is minute. But the the problem with the Zanibakov effect is it it's not really intuitive. In, in that video that the guy in Veritasium did, he said, like, they asked to find the John Beckov effect, one of his students, and and the students asked, is there any any way to intuitively understand the John Beckov effect? And, and uh, Feynman is supposed to have, like, given it some thought for about 10 seconds and then said, no. <laughs> it's, you can only understand it from the math. 
but then uh, the guy, the Veritasium guy, went ahead and did um, try to give an uh, an intuitive, um, uh, you know, explanation of it. And I think he did quite a good job. But the the main thing to think is think of it like um, a, a, a potter's wheel. So if you've ever done pottery, if you center the clay, right, it it'll stay uh, centered quite well. But if you just have a little bit of aberration, it starts going like this, and then, so it, it can sit there for like thirty minutes on on a potter's wheel, and then just this accumulation of this kind of um, a wobble grows up, and then it goes it's off and goes off the flywheel. So if you you you'll be familiar with that if you've if you've ever worked with a pot, potter's wheel, it, it it can say amazingly. Uh, fixed um, the clay, and then suddenly it goes shooting off <laughs> in one direction. Um, actually, a potter's wheel might, yeah, might, might be quite a, a rough, a rough intuitive thing. Is it, you can imagine that the, on a potter's wheel, if you get the clay just just slightly wrong um, and you speed it up too fast, um, you'll see it spin off suddenly. It's quite a it is a rough, I think, analogy. But yeah, it, it, it's uh, it's just um, about, it, 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 I think it accumulates like a child's swing, like a pendulum. It's like, it, you know, it's just a tiny little impetus. Each revolution be tiny, tiny. It's accumulating until basically it, it goes. Yeah. But yeah, and uh, yeah, it's it's very complex because those um, those things are all symmetrical, beautifully symmetrical, and then the Earth is not so, and it's liquid and stuff, so it gets complicated really, really fast. So, you know. All right, let's let's stop then. And um, that long sesh there. Sorry about that. All right, let's just fall still. Pause. Om Paramatmane Namah. Just by the way, that that thing. Uh, have a look at that Ramana Maharshi video on the thing, and then so the, what Gary was talking about is the observer and the the you know discrimination between the real and the unreal, and the only real thing is the observer. The, the Hindus call that the the Atman. And then what what is it like? Uh, the Parama Atman is the Universal observer. Mm. Anyway, oh, that's thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. For All right. Thanks, you. Cheers, then. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye. All right. Ciao. Thanks for reporting, Sophie. Be safe Cheers. out there. <laughs>